This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 80, recorded on January 7th, 2015. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. Dixon, do you know how long it's been since we recorded a twip? Yeah, it was last year sometime. In what month? (laughs) It was a long time ago. It was November. Long. In fact, it was before Turkey Day. Yeah, I know that because we were uh, sort of interrupted by holiday season and a vacation that I took. It was all your fault. It's all my fault. Can we make a New Year's resolution and (laughs) promise to do better? I know we've done this many times. The word promise to do better is fine. I'm okay with that. Promise to do exact things, that's tougher to adhere to. Okay, better. Promise to do better. Very good. Have you been, Dixon? I've been great. Happy New Year. Thank you so much. All right. And your voice is back to normal. No, not quite. It's but you had scratchy. a Batman voice, you said, on your other, on our other podcast. They had a Batman voice. <laughs> I liked having a Batman voice. I'd like to have his suit in his car. <laughs> top of it well. I'd like to have his income. <laughs> All right, now we're in this Twiv studio, right? We are. we are. Usually it's you and me. Only. But now there's a third persona we here. Have and I'm going to let you an exciting introduce him. Thank you. This is going to be a permanent addition to TWIP, is that right? This is correct. All right, well, can you introduce him? Inshallah. Or, or can I? <laughs> no, no, I would love to. you know to his title him. and all that stuff? Well, he's a, as a, he has a PhD and an MD degree. Mm-hmm. He is a former student of not, mine. Not his present title, <laughs> not his former title. Oh, his title. present title. Your present title is, his CV is sitting right in front of me. It says he is a research no, he's an associate research scientist. Mm-hmm. An associate research scientist. That's his current position. He is is a newly appointed in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics. Very good. At Columbia University. And Correct. he's also happens to be a friend of mine. I thought these that's an oxymoron. <laughs> it doesn't you know, exist. You're gonna get mail on that one. <laughs> I know. I should stop picking on you. So we should probably reveal his name now, yes? Yeah, yeah go ahead. It's it's Dr. Daniel Griffin. Oh, welcome to TWIP. Uh, thank you. We've had some letters from you on TWIV, I think. Uh, TWIV, and I think I sent a TWIP, TWIP letter paper. once a while back. Right. So, Daniel, why don't you tell the audience how we came to know each other? So, Dixon de Pommier actually was my <laughs> parasitology, one of my parasitology professors back when I was at NYU School of Medicine. You, you taught at NYU? I, I did. Wow. I did. I, a few guest lectures, not, you know... Uh, but it was on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Every year I could count on at least two lectures. And it was on tissue parasites. And there was one other topic that I used to cover, and I can't remember it right now. Ge- Geohelminths. So did they not have parasitologists there? Oh, they did. No, they had some very good ones. But they, they enjoyed the diversity of having mm-hmm. other lecturers join them. And because, you know, when I was, uh, I got my PhD at Mount Sinai, and I took the medical microbiology course with the medical students, and they used to import a parasitologist from here I know. to talk about parasites, know, Harold Brown. Harold W. Brown was my, <laughs> my mentor, as, yes. you, as everybody knows. So Daniel and I became acquainted with each other first uh, when I uh, noticed his presence in the Steve Goff lab. Did you, did you recognize him? I didn't know who he was, of course not. You just saw this new guy walk <laughs> No, I didn't know who he was. And in fact, I didn't find out who he was until he introduced himself to me. And it turns out... Did you remember him? So I remembered what he had for lunch on his way down to give the first lecture. Oh, Get out of here. I don't believe a word of it. He had, he had stopped and had sushi and used that as a point of departure. Actually, this is true. This, this happens to be true. So, um, so we, we ran into each other in the hall every now and then where you and I currently sit on the 13th floor of the Hammer Health Building in at Columbia University. Well, he comes in here all the time. To he comes speak in all the time Goff, because he's a, he who is a member of our suite, postdoc right? with Stephen Goff, yeah, okay. right? Working on retroviruses, et cetera, et cetera. So, 
Why is he working on retrovisors? Daniel, why were you working on retrovisors? Well, wait, let, let me Still just, are. can we go back even further? Sure. Can you just give us a recap of your entire career? Where, where <laughs> yes. were you born? Yes, let me do the elevator stuff. <laughs> I, I was actually born in Queens, of all wow, places. Nice. What part? I was very young at the time, so I don't remember. I know the hospital. <laughs> ah, my wife is <laughs> that was from Queens. She's from uh, Kew Gardens. Okay. Um, there's a large boulevard there in Queens, I think Queens Boulevard, and we yeah. live not far from there. But I was born at Mercy Hospital. Okay. Nice. And uh, My mom then, was a nurse, but I don't remember what hospital she was at. Okay. Queens. But, but we bounced around, bounced around a bunch. But you then bouncing, You were a bouncing baby? <laughs> we moved around a bit. But then as a teenager, I, I always tell people the movie Ghost. There's a fight oh, scene yeah, in Ghost. Yeah. My mother is a painter, and we lived in an artist co-op, and that was actually the apartment that I was oh, living in as a teenager hmm. down in down the village, um, actually Soho, and then we were in Greenwich Village, and then I was here in the city for medical school. Right. Wait, where'd you go to college? I started off at University of Miami and had a little too much fun, so I, <laughs> so I, I wanted to really focus, so I went to University of Colorado Boulder, which yeah, is a much more academic more program, <laughs> yeah. um, and then I returned here to the Where city. Where had you gone to high school here in the city? I actually went to prep school okay. um, up in Massachusetts at Berkshire Academy. Right, right. So and, here you are. And then you went to medical school at NYU. At NYU. So th what year is this roughly? This is early 90s. You can actually see it right here. And then, yeah, it's actually um, right in front of it. You did an internship and in residency in what? Uh, University of Utah in internal medicine. Mm -hmm. oh, it wow. was one of the closest to the ski slopes. <laughs> you like skiing? <laughs> I was actually a ski bum for a I while think the there. Audience is getting a drift here that's going <laughs> away from our academic life. <laughs> Well, I think as we've discussed many times, I think it's important to be balanced. Um, a Absolutely. large part of being Especially a clinician. Especially when you ski, otherwise you fall down a lot. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's where I was going with that. No, I think I think <laughs> a large part of uh, being a clinician is connecting with patients, no getting the history. No question, no question. And uh, I think it's, well, I've enjoyed being well-rounded, and I, I use that as an excuse because I claim it improves my ability as a clinician. Mm -hmm. But anyway, after three years of skiing in Utah, um, then I actually, um, I was in private practice for about a decade. Where? I, in Fort Collins, Colorado, I started a solo oh. practice. Wow. And this is uh, Colorado State University. Yeah, yeah. I was there last July for ASV. Okay. American Society for Virology. Wonderful place. It is, it is beautiful. 300 days of sun. It's a very nice place. Hmm. So you, you practiced there for 10 years? So I practiced there for 10 years, started off as solo practice, and then it grew to be the largest internal medicine practice in the town. Mm -hmm. So we had lots of patients, and a lot of docs were all working together. I actually became chief of medicine there. And then I, um, for various reasons, decided to move back to the New York area, mm -hmm. and I, um, I enrolled in a PhD program. Wait, were you married at the time? I was married at the time. Married okay. with three children. All right. That's important. Yeah. And I am still actually married with three children. <laughs> the same wife, the same three children. <laughs> yes. Dixon, you're getting a little personal here. No, yes. that's our job. Are you still married? I, what do you mean still married? <laughs> Never mind. I don't want you to answer. You moved back to the New York City. And you, you entered a PhD program? Where? did a PhD program actually out at um, the North Shore LIJ Health System. Mm -hmm. has an associated research institute, the Fine State Institute, an associated um, graduate program there, mm -hmm. the Elmezi um, School of Molecular Medicine. And it's, it's a specific PhD program, just you need to already have an MD, you have to have published, and then they have a yeah. focused. Interesting. And uh, so... They have... Um, Quite an immunology program there, if I remember. There's actually a large focus on immunology. Some, many people go from here to there. Yeah, um, I know some people who worked with Ben Pernis. Do you remember Ben Pernis? Who took positions out there, and Betty Diamond, who was here, went out there. Betty Diamond was actually the connection that okay. brought me to Columbia. Um, so after, so while doing the um, PhD, I was also. Mm -hmm. um, working as an internal medicine attending, so supervising, teaching, mm. seeing patients in that role. And um, then, after that, after the PhD, I felt like I was not educated enough. What I was the PhD in, by the way? So it's in molecular medicine, but it's really in immunology, B-cell biology. Okay. I was working on um, B1 cells, an innate B-cell. Um, after that, I then did an infectious disease fellowship, and as the latter part of that fellowship, um, I was looking for research opportunities and trying to move in a new direction, broaden my experience. And I spoke with Betty Diamond, who recommended mm -hmm. coming and working with Steve Goff, mm -hmm. which brought me initially as a visiting um, mm -hmm. scientist to Columbia, and then that became permanent. Okay. And so now you are actually a member of our faculty. I am now an associate research scientist. Outstanding. 
But you also had some international experiences. Yeah. Where did they come in? I have actually, um, and I, I they're in my CV, which is really nice. <laughs> I can look to look yeah. at this. Um, right now, when I was when I was at university in Colorado, my actual focus was um, on sort of the development of science and and why things had happened in the West versus in the East. And so I actually studied Mandarin and uh, spent some time teaching in Taiwan and some time traveling there. And when I um, was in medical school, I was able to arrange to go and spend time in Kathmandu at Beer Hospital. I remember you telling me that story on the way down to an ASTMH meeting that that we attended together in Washington, D.C. Yes. (laughs) And that's because the skiing was good there, too? (laughs) Um, Yes, the amazing mountains there. I I knew they had. No, actually, I was (laughs) interesting enough. I was working on a research project and got frustrated, as happens, and I thought it would clear my head to head to Kathmandu and do some clinical work. Do you speak Mandarin? I used to. I used to read and write. Now I can barely understand my lab mates. Okay. I was going to ask you to say something in Mandarin for some of our listeners. I bet he could say something now. Yes. Yes, as I tell my lab mates all the time, oh, what team budong? Okay. Right. What does that mean? Put your nose to the grindstone. Which really means means when you speak, I don't understand. (laughs) (laughs) So you're, you'll be here for a while at Columbia. Yes. So if you, I take it you've been listening to some of our podcasts, right? I have, actually. And it's easy to keep up because they're so infrequent. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you guys, you guys. <laughs> I resemble that remark. So you, and you um, are, are happy and willing to join the TWIP team? Uh, yes, I'm very excited. You, you said you have expertise in parasitism? So I actually, in addition to being... Um, board certified in infectious disease. I'm also um, certified in travel medicine. Nice. Not that it matters because I don't know anything about about parasitism. (laughs) Yes, you do. No, no, no. no. Poliovirus is a parasite. But those are not the kinds of... We talk about eukaryotic parasites. That's true. We do that. Not viruses. But today we have a mixed message, but that's okay. That's later on in the show. Why don't you ask me why I chose to... You don't need to tell me. I know exactly what to ask. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what, Dixon, how did you get the... Because you just announced this to me in this wonderful collaborative fashion that we have. One day, <laughs> Dixon sent me an email and said, I've decided to bring Daniel on the show. Yeah, what do you th- I asked you what you thought of that first. No, you didn't ask me what I thought. <laughs> you yes, just I announced yes, it, I but did. it's no, fine because no, no, it's did. actually a good idea. <laughs> okay, so being a good <laughs> why, idea... Why did you want to do this? Sure, because <laughs> there, there are two reasons. One is to help shoulder the burden of producing these shows every regularly rather than irregularly. You mean you're getting lazy. I'm not getting lazy. It was just that the material available to a person that has a background in basic parasitic diseases yeah. is different than the material available so, to someone with clinical experience. So you want to and expand our horizons. I do. Right? I, I okay. want to include a, a human element to this in the name of a case. Okay. And I was looking for the right venue for this and the right person for this. Remember, we had Chuck Kinnersh on for a while, and mm. but he's not available on a regular basis. And so here we have someone. He's here every day. He's here, not just here every day. <laughs> he has many similar characteristics to Chuck Kinnersh in the sense that they were both um, certificated in travel medicine. Chuck went to the uh, London School. Is that a school. word, certificated? No, probably not. Certified. 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 That's, the, the that's London school. I was close. <laughs> I was close. I was close. So they both have experience with travel medicine. They're uh. both officially recognized as travel medicine experts. They both also have had lots of experience treating HIV patients. Right. And surprisingly enough, they both had the same boss while they were here as uh, either a, an assistant professor, as Chuck Kinnersh was in the Department of Medicine, um, working with a world famous HIV person, Scott Hammer. Mm-hmm. So, um, in fact, uh, one of your appointments is with Scott Hammer, as I recall. It's actually in process. Yeah, I'm, I was uh, talking to Scott, and it looks like probably starting this spring, I'll start seeing HIV patients here and uh, doing clinical care here at Columbia. Currently, my clinical care is actually out at North Shore LIJ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's very exciting because, as you know, and as I'm sure Vincent knows too, even though he doesn't claim to be an expert on parasitism, there's a lot of associations between HIV patients and parasitic infections, mm-hmm. which are superimposed on an already compromised immune system. So that's a big connection to make in terms of revealing to the rest of our listener audience exactly the complexities facing clinicians every time they see patients because they come in with a constellation of 
signs and symptoms, and you have to sort them out and make decisions as to what's causing disease and what's just a, sure. a, a, a traveler along with this. And so uh, I thought a clinical touch would be great. And, and as part of that paradigm, and of course with uh, Dan's permission, um, we would love to present a case of the week without an answer and to invite our listeners to play along, so to speak, with the clinician and try to figure out from just the clues that are offered during the presentation of the case what the case might be. And then in the interim between the time we introduce the case and the time we reveal to the public what that case actually was, we invite the audience to participate in the dialogue by submitting their own take on that patient and mm -hmm. what they would think as this uh, evolves into a, a larger story. Mm, I think so that's, I like that's, that. the, yeah. that's the part that was missing, I think, from our uh, presentation. Right. I'm, I'm looking for other additions as well. I might as well warn you on the air. That <laughs> 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 We're looking for a molecular type person, but I think uh, Dan brings some molecular expertise sure. with him. But someone else working with molecular parasitology would be a nice addition. As we have, say, on TWIV, which were five of us, and we all bring different things to that venue, including no knowledge whatsoever about viruses. That's me. Uh, we could have a similar setup with TWIP if we work hard at it. And so here's mm. our beginning uh, piece that was missing. And so let me ask Dixon. Please. Do you envision that these clinical cases will occupy the entire episode? Or Absolutely be, not. Or just be part of it. Maybe today it will because we're. No, I think there will be as part Daniel. of it as as when we read letters, for instance. We we could devote 15 minutes or 20 minutes to the case presentation. It wouldn't take more than that because if you spent more time with Give it, it, it you'd away. be giving it away. And exactly. then the following week, we'd read some of the winners. Got and it. losers. Yeah. Because you learn from that as well, right? You do. You do. Is there a prize, Dixon? Well, there can be. We will work on that part. And it's not going to be a <laughs> cash like prize a, no matter what. Maybe like a, a mug or a T-shirt. Well, we could. We, You know what? I wouldn't be against that, as a matter of fact. I would not. It would be cool. It would be wonderful if we could set it, it up. A TWIP. Um, what is the name of this clinical case winner or something like that? Yeah, we could tell, you know. Um, okay. Um, do you see parasitic infections in Long Island? You know, we do, actually. And... Uh, we, uh, I, I thought that the paper that you guys discuss is interesting. It's a lot of things we don't think of as parasitic, mm -hmm. but yeah. what we'll be discussing is. Um, and we have lots of questions that he'll be better at answering than you. Much better. In fact, today, in fact, we have a question. We have, we have a, an ID physician in Atlanta who emails regularly. You know, oh. He has a question. So, <laughs> okay, I, I don't great. Know why, why he would have a question <laughs> for The other thing I want to. Um, state at the onset for this uh, new paradigm that we're going to develop here is that this is reflective of the way I taught parasitic diseases to the medical students here mm -hmm. and the way they taught at NYU and also Cornell. Those three medical schools had a tremendous um, resource in their faculty and many of them would show up for these presentations even though they weren't part of the discussion. They could have been because if their expertise was needed to fill in a missing piece of information for the medical students. You simply reach down and hand the microphone to that person, and they can contribute. So for our course mm -hmm. here, we had two steady participants, um, actually three. Uh, it was Chuck Kinersh, Dr. Chuck Kinersh, MD, uh, and uh, DRPH, by the way. The, the, <laughs> the, uh, the other person was an emergency medicine physician, uh, Josh Stillman. Mm -hmm. uh, who had uh, who also saw lots of admits that well, he was on a show of ours, wasn't he? He was, of on course, twip? he was. Yep, he was on a twip. Yeah, okay. And then uh, Philip D'Alessandro, who I I must take time out to mention the fact that uh, for many many years we were colleagues and friends, and and unfortunately he passed away recently. So uh, I would probably dedicate this new uh, approach to the way we offer twip to the world as dedicated to the memory of Philip D'Alessandro. He was an intellect. He was a gentleman. He was a scholar. And he will be missed. And uh, I, I think about him often, uh, even in his retirement. So um, just just know that, uh, that his, the spirit of the way he conducted himself in the lab and in the lecture hall uh, will be um, thought about a lot as we move forward in this presentation, in, in this new way of presenting uh, parasitic diseases. Okay. Okay? Um, Daniel, do you prefer Daniel or Dan? <laughs> You know, Daniel will work. Okay, because I like Vincent. You know, He's got a bow tie on it. We must describe his <laughs> physical appearance here. He's very formally attired right now because he's in his physician well, compared mode. Compared to you, he's in his physician is mode. Well, in, in the old days, when we taught here, everyone showed up with a tie. Not me. 
No, in the old days, I what said. What do you mean old? I was here in 1982. <laughs> That's not the no. It's not old. The, no, the old days were in the 70s, and you know, in the transition period. And then as soon as everyone became informal, because it intimidated the patients to see a doctor in a white coat and a tie, it's too official. Yeah, they still it's, wear ties. It's, it's too... Um, it separates the physician from the patient too much, as they saw around here. So they allowed an informality to creep into the to the bedside. And as a result, the teachers adopted that as their modus operandus as well. And so as as a result, you know, you could show up, not in a T-shirt, you wouldn't do, do that, but you could show up less formally uh, presented as they do. But, and but so, you've, you've carried, so you've carried it to an extreme, I see. <laughs> no, I, um, I, yes, I, I, I like to think the bow tie sends a, a message of respect for the patients that, you know, oh, I'm, okay. I'm willing to sort of dress different up for tie. the occasion. Yes, I agree. Um, and I, I think the bow tie may be different than the tie. Um, doesn't doesn't create that kind of separation, and there's a there's a hygienic issue. I mean, the yeah. the tie is kind of <laughs> filthy. I mean, we like to think that we do white collar work, but you know, as a clinician, you're you're dealing with wounds and infected areas, and it, it's are, it's messy are. stuff. You really don't you mean a tie want, that hangs. You down. really don't want a tie hanging down. No, you don't want. Well, yeah, the microbiome of ties has been well studied. Has it really? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense because this doesn't hang down. Uh, yeah, mine is more of a menu of restaurants I've eaten at. <laughs> but that's Daniel, how often do you have to? Uh, see patients in Long Island? Um, I think it more of as a privilege than I have to, mm. but Tuesday, currently on Tuesdays I've been seeing patients okay. out there. One day a week, so you stay yes, out there. You, I presume you live on Long Island as well. I do. I live not very far, actually. I live in yeah. Port Washington, which is very close to North Shore Hospital, where I see the patients. And then you have to take the train here every... I was taking I was taking the train, but the train takes really forever, so I've actually switched to driving, which mm -hmm. seems to work a little bit better. And... Um, yeah, this, so currently it's one day a week um, for a bit of time, like up until about a year ago, it was 80 hours a week in the hospital, and that was sort of a challenge to try to balance <laughs> research and 80 hours a week of clinical care. All right. Right. Well, how long does the commute take? Uh, much too long. Much too long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I drive 38 miles from New Jersey every day. Mm. Okay. Which takes dear, dear, dear. minimum an hour. But so most, I I drive eighteen miles. miles and it takes about two hours. Um, really? It's all a it's all a question of when you time yeah, it. Of course. If you can you know if you can stagger your day, come in a little bit late. Often it's quick. I've come in like five thirty on a Saturday and it's a thirty minute drive. It's magical, but often it's right. traffic. Yeah. yeah, the driving is no fun. Well, the whole New York metropolitan area is not fun to commute in. All right, should we start with a clinical case? Let's do that. You want to do the clinical case first? I don't know, Dixon. What do you think would be best? Well, I thought we should should end on the clinical. That's case, fine. To be honest. Okay. So I thought the presentation of today's subject would be a good way to involve all, right. all of us. Do you want to do the case after or before email? Oh, good question. Let's, let's end with email. I like to do that. Oh, okay, fine. So we'll do the second thing as the case, and yeah. then the email. So, That's a good idea. So first, so we'll you do know, the way this is going to work is he's going to surprise us, right? He's he never will. going to tell us what we got. No, it's I don't want to know. I don't want to know. You especially. You'll probably guess it right away, <laughs> no, that's right? That's okay, but you know, I, I, I won't participate in the guessing. All right. So, so you want to do this paper that you picked? I do, I do, I do. Uh, so this paper has a title, of course, and it's called An Emerging Mycoplasma Associated with Trichomoniasis, Vaginal Infection and Disease. And uh, all of the authors appear to be from uh, the uh, Commonwealth University of Virginia. And uh, so that's a United States study. And it's basically, it's a clinical study. Hey, Dixon, did you notice one of the authors? Did I notice one of the authors? Has an unusual name. Has, well, everybody's got an unusual name if you don't know them. Um, There's an author called the Vaginal Microbiome Consortium. It's well, listed as an author on this paper. <laughs> okay, well, that, that is an unusual I've never author. seen a consortium <laughs> right. listed as an author. Well, here it is, though. It's weird. And here it is. So what it turns out to be is um, a genetic analysis and a pathological, a patho clinical pathological analysis of a variety of clinical presentations of trichomonas vaginalis with an aim in mind to explain the difference between asymptomatic and symptomatic patients. Why is there such a, a big difference between women who present with trichomoniasis, uh, and what what is the uh, the origins of that uh, difference? And so, as a background, uh, because we're going to lead up to the fact that this organism shares a microbiome also, and there may be something associated with this organism in the microbiome which it 
either doesn't take advantage of but comes along for the ride and causes an additional pathology or aids and abets the parasite in causing pathology. So when we were talking about this, that is uh, Dan and I at lunch, uh, we decided to broaden the discussion to include the parasites that we've already talked about in this show that have microbiological associations, which without them, there was no pathology, but with them, there was pathology. And I know that you'll recall them also, Vincent, because you're a, a good listener and a good uh, student of uh, science. So do you remember our discussion about river blindness? Nope. Oh, <laughs> that was the right response, by the way. <laughs> tell me about it, Dixon. Well, I don't want to tell you the whole thing, but but remember back when we were discussing the the relationship of Wolbachia, okay, the bacterial endosymbiont, with the pathology caused by this organism, Onchocerca volvulus. So the Wolbachia is an endosymbiont it of is. Onchocerca. Okay. It certainly is, and as the result. Um, it was never known before, but it was proven by simply giving a patient antibiotics to get rid of the Wolbachia rather than the worm, that it turns out that the pathology of this infection is due to the Wolbachia rather than the worm. Mm -hmm. What a remarkable discovery, mm -hmm. because it really simplifies therapy at this point. Um, and it did, by the way. And, and, and in many cases where they couldn't get a hold of the, the drug of choice, which is ivermectin, to mm -hmm. get rid of the worm... You can give a patient uh, some antibiotic, uh, like clindamycin or stuff like this. Dan is much uh, more knowledgeable at that area. Or so doxycycline. Or doxycycline. Uh, and the pathology changes as the result uh, because the endosymbiont mm -hmm. is gone. The parasite continues to survive. The so are, there, are there examples of people who are infected with Onchocerca without Wolbachia and they have no disease? I um. I actually don't know the answer to that, but I I have a feeling that that all of them are infected with Wolbachia. Yeah. Did we talk about that? On we did. The we did. Yeah. And we also talked about it with regards to Wuchereria bancrofti, the mm -hmm. causative agent for elephantiasis, and that too has an endosymbiont, a Wolbachia endosymbiont. There is another one, however, and, I, and right now I'm blocking on the name. I thought it was um, Mancinella ozardi or one of those uh, minor filarial parasite infections of humans that did not have a Wolbachia association. And, I'm, and I have no data whatsoever on Dirofilaria emidus, the dog heartworm, which mm. is also a filarial parasite. But it doesn't cause much pathology in terms of inflammation. So uh, that's, that's, that's basically the, the deal here, is that the parasites with the Wolbachia endosymbionts cause an inflammation and therefore uh, a heightened disease state. So today we've got a, a, a non-helminth parasite, namely a protozoan, that's associated with a mycoplasma, uh, which is a bacterial species, right? Okay, just mm -hmm. to be correct. Mm -hmm. What is the classification of mycoplasma? And uh, there are some fuzzy areas in microbiology that I've lost track of, and maybe you can bring us up to date on that, Vincent, because you also are the co-host for TWIM. Well, the mycoplasma, which uh, consists of two genera, the mycoplasma and the ureoplasma. Okay. They generally are, they have small genomes, re, what we say reduced genomes. Reduced genomes. Because they've lost a lot of genes that would otherwise be needed because okay. they're, they are supplied by their bacterial Look symbionts. At right? Look at that. So they tend to be small. They don't have cell walls. Okay. Right? Uh, and they're dependent. They're they're not always dependent on the bacteria, but most are of the chlamydia time they are chlamydia part of that group too. <clears throat> Is chlamydia mycoplasma similar? But no, it's not the same. No. It's a different similar, but genus. no. Okay, um, but they can grow independently. All right. Okay. So do, are mycoplasma obligate intracellular parasites? <sighs> Sometimes. Not always. <laughs> no, no, I said obligate intracellular parasites. Are they obligate? So are they facultative or obligate intracellular parasites? Are they intracellular? Now, now you got me, Dixon. I don't know. Well, Daniel, not, do you know? I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, I mean, the obligate sort of forces you. It's, you can't say sometimes. Um, no, that's right. Yeah. No, I mean, I think of them in general, but I don't know if it's, if it's required across. Okay, because, because trichomonas is not an intracellular parasite. No, it is not. It's free living, right? So it's not free living, of course not. Trichomonas. It's not, it's not a free living parasite where does it, at all. Where does it? Uh, it infects the vaginal tract, the urogenital tract. Well, by free living, I mean it doesn't. It, it doesn't live within another cell. That's right. But Giardia is a. Yeah, I understand. Uh, Extracellular. It. It's an obligate parasite. So remind me, Trichomonas. Yes. Is a human parasite. There is no animal reservoir. There's none. 
It exists in humans and is passed from human to human. By sexual contact. Right. Only. Except now, there you are... Know, you know what, Dixon? This is interesting because when we did the Trichomonas episode, yeah. a physician in the Philippines yes. emailed us because we had talked about infections not being transmitted by sexual well, activity. Well, I was about to get to that. And he, was, he, he had to apologize to a patient who tested positive for trichomonas, and he said, well, you got this sexually, but she didn't. If it's a woman... And after hearing our episode, he said... If it's a woman, at the time of birth... Yes, that's it. The <clears throat> child can acquire the infection if it passes through the birth canal. So that's only for female, uh, future female patients. For male uh, births, that doesn't happen. So you can acquire it at birth, and then later on it can develop into a full-blown infection. And that's an a, a non-sexual transmission route. But that's the only exception to that uh, statement. So everybody else in the world acquires this infection via sexual contact. And I'm not sure, but whether mycoplasma is uh, very commonly found throughout the urogenital tract also. And maybe our clinician on well, staff they're not, they're not answer Well, they're not obligate intracellular parasites. They are not. Okay. Okay, in fact, fine. they're often common contaminants of our cell cultures. And you yeah, can't well, see them because they're so tiny, but they, they reproduce extracellularly. Okay, fine. All right. Yeah. What can you tell us, Daniel? <laughs> no, I think what you added there is great because that is something that comes up all the time when people look at their cell cultures yeah. and are, oh, right. I think it may have been contaminated okay. with mycoplasm. Oh, okay. And I, right. I think that may be more widespread than we realize in the lab. Um, not everyone's really screening for that, so that may be affecting some of our conclusions. Right. But no, mycoplasm has been a tough um, organism in the whole genitourinary um, pathology. Um, area for a long time it was discounted it's not mm -hmm. easy to cultivate uh -huh, as uh -huh. we're going to see here right. um, so you have a whole issue with your Koch's postulates how do you really prove that this is what's causing it it's not growing on your normal urinary cultures right. you target it with antibiotics do those antibiotics necessarily change symptoms does that count um, I mean, they're starting to be, mycoplasm and ureaplasm are, I think, starting to be recognized more widely as causes of urethritis, oh. both men and women. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't an easy road, and it, it is now, you often go through an algorithm, you've ruled everything out, maybe you've treated empirically, and then often you treat these empirically. Right. Um, and again, it's a challenging organism because our paradigm is changing from this sort of entrenched, um, you have to culture it, you have to identify it, to you're treating, sure, you're treating sure. based on symptoms, which we really are not supposed to be doing. <laughs> so in this paper, they say that mycoplasmas are often associated with bacterial vaginosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, preterm labor, and preterm birth. So the word associated implies this uncertainty right Ex exactly right. this right. evolving and I, I think as our molecular testing moves into this area hopefully that uncertainty is going to be resolved to some degree yeah are they also associated with pneumonia well there's clearly a mycoplasm pneumonia which is mm. our atypical our walking pneumonia yeah. and you know and what i mean we mean by atypical basically it presents atypically compared to the dominant pneumococcal low bar pneumonia um, at least that's the classic teaching. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> our readers will probably point out that uh, all our classic teachings are maybe not as classically right, right, right. verified. But no, the mycoplasm is the type of pneumonia that will often sweep through a barracks, through college, through uh, direct contamination, where your pneumococcal seems to be taking advantage of you know your compromised host, let's yeah. say. But yeah. yeah, the mycoplasm is actually a very common cause of pneumonia. Okay, so that's one part of the story here, but the real part is the connection between it and trichomoniasis. So mm -hmm. let's just briefly uh, recap what we know mm -hmm. about trichomonas, because trichomonas vaginalis has been around a long time, obviously, but not as long as you think. And now, how did we know that? And we didn't find that out until we actually sequenced it in its entire genome. And that was only done in 2007. And so, so in 2007, the um, uh, sort of the overview of the genetics of this organism was revealed. And in doing so, they saw a lot of lateral transfer of genetic material from bacterial species to Trichomonas itself. It has acquired a lot of genes along the way. So today, Vincent, just as a guess now, just I'm going to ask you to just guess. Mm -hmm. How many genes do humans have? Um, anywhere between, I would say, 25 and 75,000. Oh, that's a big range. Yeah, because it depends on how you define a gene. Okay, well, the proteasome will hopefully tell us, right? Well, the problem is that one gene can be 
it can produce a protein that okay. is modified in different ways. Okay. Okay. So right. the proteum is going to be very different from All the right. genome. So guess how many... The problem is that when you see the sequence of a yeah. genome, yeah. you don't necessarily know what a gene is, right? Oh, you're right. You're what is a gene right. typically begins with methionine and ends with a stop uh, code, exactly. but there are big exceptions, yeah. sure, right? Sure, and sure. what about really small sure. ones? So well, we're kind of a big range. We're kind of stuck with that logic for the trichomonas. But let's see how many human genes, how many human genes, if we type that into I Google. I think you're going to find it's around 25,000 um, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so here's an article that says, says 20,000. Right. Um, so th it previously so has been thought to be as high as 100,000. We're so still debating this. Let's though. say 25,000. 25, 25 okay. right. So guess how many genes uh, <clears throat> Trichomonas has? Uh, 5,000? No, 60,000. Are you 60, serious? Zero. Yeah, 60. <laughs> 60,000. And a lot of those genes are associated with bacterial processes of attachment, of um, inclusion into the cell itself. Wow. Sounds like a viral problem. Almost. How many genes does, do orchids have? They have a lot. I mean, they're. Is probably, that the biggest genome? Well, I, uh, I was told that, but that might not be still true because we know more about other things now. But I think orchids have huge numbers this of genes. Is, I found this great chart. Here it is a genome size uh, chart, um, which. <laughs> oh, the biggest genome is. Yes. yes. Actually, there are a couple that tie at 130 gigabases, not megabases. So our, the human genome, let's see. You have to scroll is it, down is it on this? It's not even on this chart. <laughs> uh, we don't rank. Human is 3.2 gigabases, 3 .2. which is a f weird way to say it, but that's 3.2 billion bases. Well, they have to right? compare it to everything else, I guess, right? The and marbled will... lungfish is 130 <laughs> gigabases. Look at that. It's the largest vertebrate genome <laughs> The marbled what? lungfish. So the next time you catch one, <laughs> you, don't you should catch throw it back fish. at Dixon. <laughs> yes. You don't catch lungfish? <laughs> no, they bury themselves in the mud. <laughs> What's the smallest uh, genome, Dixon? That's another good question. I think it's it's got to be a bacterial of some sort, right? Or it's a viral genome. Yeah. Well, it's be a viral genome. A viroid genome. Viroid. Which encodes no protein. Is could be 200 bases long. Right. But it depends whether you want to encode a protein. There but there are go. some infectious agents without a genome, Dixon. <laughs> I'm not going to go there at all. Prions. <laughs> Prions. Prions. Oh. That's true. This anyway. is true. So, so they have 60,000 60, genes. genes. That's a lot of genes. A potential for 60,000 genes. And this so, is a parasite. This is a parasite. And a lot of them relate to their odd structures. All right. Now, this is a, this is a flagellated protozoan. It's distantly related to the trypanosomes. So they're mastigophrins. Those are all in the in the order of mastigophrin, mm -hmm. and they've got flagelli, and they've got an undulating membrane, and they've got an axostyle, and they've got parabasal bodies, and they've got all kinds of crazy things inside. But guess what? They don't have Vincent. They don't have mitochondria. They have zero mitochondria. They have chloroplast. They don't have chloroplasts. What do they have? They don't have mitochondria. Nothing. They have a modified. Apical modified. Blast? Well, it's even worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> they have something called a hydrogenosome. Yeah, right. That's what and, Deduve uh, discovered, right? Well, not Deduve, but Miklos Schmuller in Deduve's laboratory. He okay. was the discoverer of the hydrogenosome. You know, I used to work on trypanosomes. Not trypanosomes. Uh, trichomonas. Who? I used to. Did you really? Yeah. Really? You have a connection to this paper, then? Yeah, I, I looked at them under the microscope. I looked at your for your name in the back. I didn't and see I it. I never published. <laughs> oh, I was a technician in a laboratory. And Interesting. We, um, yeah. I worked in a company a year after I graduated from college. Uh, I worked for a year yeah. in a company who, which made products, uh -huh. and one of them was a, uh, a product to kill to kill it, like a vaginal uh, cream? Yes, it was some kind of ointment. I forgot the name of it. But it. I would get samples from production weekly, and we would test them for oh, potency. Very interesting. So we had cultures of that's very interesting. trichomonas. Interesting. And I, I remember they were wonderful. Fl flagella sure, in the sure, undulate. Sure. You could see them moving around. But you remember that you had to grow them anaerobically, yes? Yeah. Yeah, it was great. And I so, used to add this dilutions to make sure yeah. it was potent, and they would release it based on my recommendation. Right. Now, the environment of the vagina, though, is not anaerobic it's micro aerophilic mm -hmm. so this organism is a micro aerophil tolerant organism mm -hmm. meaning what 
It that will it, tolerate some it, air, right? Some not oxygen. only that, it has to have a defense mechanism against the oxygen, though. So it won't damage it. So it has a lot of enzymes inside, like superoxide dismutase and things of this sort, which it uses to counteract the presence of, of small amounts of oxygen. You know, it's interesting because the mycoplasma genome uh, also encodes uh, such enzymes. You know, right? Now For we're the same getting reason. closer. Now we're getting closer to. So what? What this are, is called a true symbiosis, by the way, because these are two unrelated organisms. Wait, are wait. Now. Are you saying that the mycoplasma and the trichomonas are symbiotes? That's what I'm That's saying. the implication. That is their implication. Right? It's not proven by this paper. Well, no, and it's certainly not because the uh, the asymptomatic infections were largely from women that did not have the mycoplasma associated well, Jason, why with... Don't you, why don't you tell us what the data so, but are? I, I want to go back to the organism first, uh, sure. just to set the stage Which for one? this. Which one? Trigger bonus. Okay. So, okay, so as we've... <laughs> we've exhausted our knowledge for the mycoplasma I'm afraid <laughs> and there are people out there laughing that's okay this is good to laugh so the organism itself uh, trichomoniasis is a treatable trichomonas well, is the organism okay the disease it causes is, uh, or the infection it causes is called trichomoniasis mm -hmm. um, is treatable okay with an agent which attacks obligate anaerobes Okay, and that drug is called metronidazole. And is he right, Daniel? You know, metronidazole and tinidazole. Tinidazole. Would be the two. It's a yeah. derivative of metronidazole, <clears throat> and it attacks the. So yes, he is right. <laughs> now I can check. <laughs> Barely, but <laughs> <laughs> hanging by a thread. I don't mind being wrong. That's 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 why we're here to to tell the truth, not not to see who's right and wrong. So there are some resistant strains of trichomoniasis of trichomonas. Okay, and and the first one was discovered here at Columbia, by Wayne Miller, Dr. Wayne Miller, who was the admitting attendant in OBGYN, and a good friend of mine, because we used to fish together. Yep. And he one day... He just uh, grabbed I your did, arm. I did, I grabbed... Are you a fisherman Because well? he's a fisherman. He's yes. definitely a fisherman. Yes. So he's a skier, he's a fisherman. <laughs> Anything yes. else we should know? Um, sailing. Sailing an avid Mountain sailor. climbing. And... Uh, Youth soccer coaching. Youth soccer Big, coaching. Fortunately, okay. a bigger part of my life than it probably should be. <laughs> so you uh, would not, uh, as an infectious disease person, you would not be treating uh, trichomonal infections. That would be a kind of OBGYN person, right? You know, it's interesting who, who ends up treating yeah. these. Um, <laughs> for my you know, decade in primary care, they, they come to you. They yeah. come to their primary care doc. There are you know, specialty STD clinics, but if you think about it, if, if you or one of your friends developed, um, but you probably wouldn't seek out an STD clinic. You would probably end up going to your primary sure. care doc. Um, yeah. Women are going to go to OBGYNs, or right. actually are That's often right. the primary care docs mm -hmm. of uh, yes. women. Um, men would go. Now, it's, um, it's something that can be diagnosed if you have the right um, setting. I mean, it's, and, and I think that's important. You can culture trichomonas Correct. and make your diagnosis that way. Mm. Um, but uh, ideally, an easy way to do it is actually just to do a wet mount, just to look yeah. at the fluid under yeah, the microscope. Right. Right. But there's a time issue. You, you have is. to look at there it within is. probably 10 minutes. After about 10 minutes, as you probably know from your start time. To fall apart. They, yeah, you start to lose yeah. your ability right. to diagnose. So the sensitivity of the assay actually has yeah. a lot to do with your access right. to immediately look at a microscope and mm. to know what you're looking at. Yeah. Or to inject them into thioglycolate medium. Which is the other standard that you would have in your uh, in your lab? Or so, office. so you can't take a, a specimen and stick it in an envelope and put it outside in the no mailbox way. and let it sit there for a day and to be picked up by Quest and blah. It's not going to yeah. work right? uh, unless you could do a PCR, PCR on yeah. sample that was yeah. left over. But that doesn't. That's and actually, that's that's moving in. Is um, I would say um, more diagnoses are based upon um, PCRs now for trichomonas mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. molecular testing instead of because of um, right. you know even though it's pretty inexpensive. Right to throw a slide under a microscope and look. Um, yeah, a lot of the logistics of doing that. Time and stuff and it's, un it's, it's exact. Un yeah, it's unfortunate, but maybe it's not because at the same time you could be screening for other infections. You know, gonococcal, sure. chlamydial. You know, make sure you've got everything. Because you don't want to just treat trichomonas, as we're now realizing there's right. often a lot of things going on. You know, it's interesting. I was. Uh, we have a couple of dogs, and they're always at the vet, right? And when you bring them, they take a specimen, and the girl says, I'm going to go test this for so-and-so right now. She goes and does the lab <laughs> test and brings you the result. This never happens with humans, right? That's right. Well, well, un unfortunately, yeah. You know, I, I, in the spring, it wasn't this spring. It was the spring before I rotated through the STD clinic that is over um, in the Bronx. 
and it's you know it's it's a wonderful place to spend some time because there's so much pathology you mm-hmm. learn a lot and it, it really is done like at the you know someone comes in they present a problem and you immediately are right. looking at it under the microscope really? that's great and they have a tech who's there that's right you know on and so not only is it a clinician who sees a little bit it's someone who sees a high volume in an area and it, it's great you really you yeah. really make yeah. the diagnosis and then even better they're immediately treating the people right then mm-hmm. that's right so in the old days this is the very old days back in the 1960s New York City had four tropical disease clinics. Mm-hmm. They were walk-in clinics. Anyone could come in, give a specimen, sit down, wait for the answer, and get treated the same within the same hour almost. And if one of them was, was a, here, right? One of them was here on the corner. Oh. And they're gone now? 168th Street. Well, they were all replaced. All by? By other clinics that were deemed more necessary because, hey, the parasitic loads are going down because the immigrations from these areas are going down. Maybe that okay. was one of the reasons. Okay. We don't know. So at any rate, this this paper addresses a very important issue, and that is, when you see a parasite in a patient, should or shouldn't you treat? Yeah, that is the big issue. But like so, a, like a trichomonas, for right? So, so for instance, this well, if they're not in, symptomatic, they wouldn't come in to begin with. And right? what is well, that's not necessarily true. This could be on a pap smear. You can find trichomonas okay. on a pap smear, for instance, which is all done by microscopy, but it's probably automated microscopy in this case. Then they say unusual cell scene. Then that goes to a person that actually mm-hmm. looks. And by the way, these are highly paid people. <laughs> so if anybody out there is thinking about home industries that they want to get involved with reading pap smears for unusual cell types is a great way to make a lot of money. Um, so the, they see the organism. Now, is the person sick from this or is it just an incidental finding? I think the nucleic acid testing is going to actually really feed more into this paradigm because person will be mm-hmm. screened. Okay. And we'll be screening someone. Yeah. And you'll just, you'll get the phone call, yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. I called in your tinidazole two grams to the party. <laughs> go, go pick that up. <laughs> and it'll be from a nurse. And they're like, but I feel fine. Right. And and there may be an issue. Um, I think the standard right now is we would treat them if it was positive. We wouldn't then go and say, oh, well, only if you have this secondary mycoplasm do we really need to treat you. So here's how to get sick when you're not sick. You have trichomonas, you're not sick, you sent the drug, you take the drug, and then you go to a cocktail party. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with this picture? Well, if you're not Irish, you're going to have some issues. (laughs) Well, no, the the metronidazole itself should not be taken, and then you have alcohol on top of that. It gives you an antabuse-like effect. Unless you have very high levels, which the Irish uh, have been selected <laughs> oh, for. I see, I see, yes. I so, see. Dixon, what fraction of women are... Do men have also trichomonas? You're not going to ask me that question anymore. You will ask the clinician that question yeah, well, because he's got Daniel, the Daniel, what fraction... First of all, do men have trichomonas infections? They do, actually. I mean, this isn't that women are having sexual mm-hmm. contact with women. It's actually um, men are probably involved in the majority of the transmission of trichomonas at some point. Um, and there's even a discussion about who's more symptomatic. Is it the women that are more symptomatic mm-hmm. or the men? Is this a problem among gay men, men who have sex with men? You know, it is. And then it becomes not just a urethral um, site. Mm-hmm. It can also involve other sites. Okay. So, so what fraction of the population is positive for trichomonas in, in the absence of symptoms? Um, how, like that? how many people I don't think we know that yeah, like how many people know. have asymptomatic trichomonas colonization I don't think we know that well there have been some surveys because there have been some typings of the trichomonas organism to see whether or not they're highly virulent mm-hmm. semi-virulent or not virulent avirulent and they've looked around the world for this in certain communities and they've had they've had statistics published on this in the past but that number fluctuates rapidly I wanted to also bring another factoid into the conversation which really needs to be discussed, of course. This paper is not just trivial in the sense that they're trying to say whether or not the symptomatic cases are associated with mycoplasma, because what are the symptoms from fulminating vaginitis caused by trichomoniasis? You know, it's interesting. They actually they, they talk about the two different criteria for diagnosing, you know, whether someone has, you know, talk about Ansel's criteria versus um, Nugent's criteria for mm. a lot of the criteria we use as clinicians. You, you want to ultimately have a yes or a no answer when you're, you're diagnosing some sort of a vaginitis infection. Um, but there probably is more of a con- continuum there. And even with your common urinary tract infections, you're not always going to progress to get horribly ill. A lot of things will resolve on their own. You may be catching it. Um, when it's moving in that direction. So that's a challenge for the clinician. Um, 
And so the, the woman comes in with sure, symptoms, sure. and you can isolate the trichomonads, see them under the microscope, or say verify it with nuclear um, amplification testing. Then yes, we go ahead and treat, and then hopefully we follow up. Do you feel better? And then right. we can put it all together and say yes to you. You satisfied all the criteria, and I feel like we pulled it all together and treated you. Now someone comes in and you screen, and you detect that oh you're positive for trichomonads. Um, then it's a challenge. Exactly. So uh, what I was really aiming towards was your connection with HIV. Mm -hmm. Because if there's enough pathology created by the exposure to both of these organisms, assuming that this paper has uh, defined the conditions under which uh, uh, overt pathology will occur, so that the condition can just look and say, you know, uh, you've really got a serious infection here. There's an erosion of the uh, epithelium. Uh, that could allow for other um, invasions as the result of uh, an open wound. Let's say, I know the worry for syphilis is like that as well, and for perhaps gonorrhea um, in certain countries, like say, for instance, Sub-Saharan Africa, where the transmission of the AIDS virus is very high. Um, they tend to link it to other infections, which uh, break down the barriers of protection, the, the first line of defense, name, namely. So would would a woman coming in with a uh, inflamed vaginal wall uh, due to trichomonas due to trichomonas vaginalis would they be more less or, or neutrally susceptible to an HIV infection as well yeah I mean the, the trichomonas um, clinical syndrome actually involves quite a bit of inflammatory response <clears throat> and that's actually one of the criteria when you when you look at this fluid it actually is a fluid with activated um, immune cells in there. The, um, I think there's two sides to what you're describing. We, we worry that in a population that has a lot of um, sexually transmitted diseases that compromise the barrier, that that's going to increase um, the likelihood of HIV. There's also the issue that a more activated immune system um, seems to make a person more vulnerable to HIV infection. So you've, right. you've compromised the right. barrier, right. you've activated right. cells, which makes them more vulnerable to HIV infection. Sure. Um, I think that's particularly true for some of the viral, um, you know, like the herpes viruses, um, for instance. Um, trichomonas, it would make sense. I don't know if I've you know, looked at a study that's specifically focused on that specific infection and then right. the relation to the right, HIV right, risk. Right. Dixon, do you remember the um, paper we did? I think it was um, trichomonas that the presence of a virus is correlated yeah. with more inflammation in it's, tissues. The double stranded RNA viruses, I recall. Twip, um, trichomonas, let's see. Well, that's exactly right. You are exactly yeah. right. Uh, indeed, indeed. I'm trying to find the episode here. <laughs> um, no, that's trichomon That's the life cycle. I think it was a trichomonal virus, and at least in an animal model, having the virus present led to higher inflammatory and there were TLR uh, well, whatever the, the and things of this sort involved as well yeah while you're looking actually in this paper maybe yes. we'll get to the paper we will um, <laughs> <laughs> but if, if, if not if not I mean one of the things here it is. it's trichomonas it's a virus sorry the virus okay, of a protozoan parasite trichomonas may exacerbate disease and that's episode 47 for whom the trick tolls because uh -huh. it's a toll-like receptor that's right. a virus. <laughs> no, sorry Daniel go ahead no that's a clever <laughs> clever title um, <laughs> the uh, no as they, as they talk about in this paper one of the challenges that you know we're always trying to understand is what is it about the diseases that causes the disease? What about the right. pathogen That's makes right. us That's sick? Right. What is doing the damage? Sure. And you know, this paper actually tries to explore that, but yes. starting with the fact that we're not we're not always sure. And with trichomonas, right. we're not always exactly sure what it is. Is it that it's exciting the immune system and the immune system's doing it, or is there some specific agent that's coming from the the trichomonad that's right. actually causing the destruction? And here they actually talk a, a lot about the TLR, I think it's TLR2 that actually they, they talk about in this paper. And somehow because of this endosymbiotic relationship, they're um, causing more TLR, triggering, causing more inflammation because of that. So Dixon, can we uh, Let's get, to, get the paper. to the paper? It's so time. It, we actually can do this relatively expeditiously because uh, a lot of this is, is information beyond which we talk about in TWIP. And so this is a study of 1,361 
women who visited outpatient clinics, and they have mid-vaginal samples from them. That's a very large sample, by the way. And also 110 samples collected in a labor unit. And in 25, and they sequenced the 16S ribosomal RNA, which would tell you what the microbiome is, right, Dixon? Right. So that's, that's relatively straightforward. You bet. 25 of these samples, it's 25 out of 1,471, right. had a novel mycoplasma in them, which they call Candidatus mycoplasma gerardi, after right. a uh, physician, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> who was, uh, they say at the end of this, paper it's dedicated to his um memory he was a very uh, here we go mm-hmm. gerard ph gerard an american obstetrician and gynecologist for his dedication to clinical practice and his contributions to the research of the vaginal microbiota so 25 had this new um <clears throat> mycoplasma right which and it's by the way dixon do you know why it has candidatus in front of the name i'm sure you're going to tell me <laughs> and I learned this from Twim. So you can't name a, a genus species uh, until you've grown it and characterized it, and they can't culture this. So there are many bacteria that have candidatus in front of the name oh, because, because they haven't candid, been cultured. They can't, They're they, a candidate. I got it. So this is a candidate, got Mycoplasma got it, got it, got it. girardi. And, Interesting. Um, so basically, in these 25 women, this was highly abundant. Right. This, and these 25 women, 22 of these had a clinically diagnosed vaginal infection, right? And right. there were various infections, which are in this table here. And experienced, at least one of them experienced a premature labor event. Right. Trichomoniasis, bacterial vaginosis, yeast infections, etc. Sure. Of various sorts. So um, then they, so they have the, se- the, the ribosomal sequence of this, this Mycoplasma, and they can go on and ask, "What's the association?" Sure. Um, and they, and here is where they talk about these various um, criteria that you were mentioning before: the Nugent scores or the Amsil scores. And these are ways of of diagnosing vaginal they, infections. As, they, is that correct? They are actually. Um, I mean, Amsil's criteria. I actually printed this out just to for for reference. Um, but when you're when you're trying to diagnose um, what's brought a woman in with vaginitis, there, there's a number of things you'll look at. One um, is the actual discharge color, the color mm. of, of what you're seeing. And um, <clears throat> as I, I mentioned before, with the trichomoniasis, you actually are seeing a real purulent discharge. You are, mm. um, and it, it's it's often a dirty gray to a green. And when I'm teaching the medical residents, I always ask them what makes it green. And they always say, oh, it's a dead bacteria. But it's actually the, <laughs> it's the myeloperoxidase in the activated mm. neutrophils. So you're actually seeing inflammatory cells, which you can get w- even without an organism. So you're not seeing the organism, but you're seeing inflammation. Right. Your bacterial vaginitis also, the yes. itis, you're getting, you're getting yes. a green too. Um, your candida, and, and probably a lot of people in our audience will know it's going to be more of a white, yep. right? You're actually yep. seeing yep. the candida. Um, right. So isn't there one other thing here too? Well, I put in the, the bacterial vaginosis. Um, which is different than bacterial vaginitis, sure. right? The distinction sure. being one is the sort of osis versus itis. Itis involves the inflammation, where the osis is there's a presence of something, but you're not seeing the itis, the mm-hmm. inflammation uh-huh. characteristic. There's also um, the number of white cells. When you look mm-hmm. under sure, the microscope, sure. Sure. as we talked about, which is ideal if you can look right away, you're going to see a lot more of the white cells. So this is where we're kind of running through Ansel's criteria. All right. Um, the other is there's actually an odor, and it isn't necessarily just, oh, I, I detect an odor myself or a woman might complain of it, but when you apply um, potassium hydroxide, there's actually a release of the means, which gives it a fishy odor. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's another. So, so they, there's sort of a three of four Ansel's criteria draws you down to, to what you might be trying to diagnose. And Ansel's criteria nugents were specifically for bacterial vaginitis, right. and then you're going to you know, use these same criteria, actually, you know, whether it's a candidal infection, you're going to go through yeah. the same, yeah. what color is it, what smell, and then there's even a pH aspect, uh-huh. and, you know, you'll use a pH to help pin it down. The, um, the Ansel's is basically going to give you a yes or no. You have three of the four, so you say yes, you say no, you, you progress. Mm. The Nugent's is um, something that people like more for research, because you're actually going to do a gram stain, Hmm. And then there's actually a grading system that a pathologist is going to give you a, a Nugent score. And I think researchers like that more because it's more of a continuous. Yeah. And yeah. It's probably more realistic and honestly, but differ, difficult to employ clinically because you ultimately want to decide with your patient, do we treat you or not? 
So um, some of the additions to this scoring were brought up by the clinicians that helped me teach this course because uh, there's one other criteria which would rule in trichomoniasis as a causative agent, and that is, or trichomonas, I should say, and that is a frothiness to the exudate. Actually, that's true. So the frothiness to the exudate is due to what? It's due to the hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, produced by the hydrogenosome. Mm -hmm. So it's throwing out all of these electrons in the form of hydrogen. Molecular hydrogen is a valuable compound, though, isn't it? What if we could somehow make a, uh, a cell-free extract of the hydrogenosome that would generate hydrogen from, let's say, a source like water? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. The molecular biology of this is, is a little bit still fuzzy because after they sequenced the entire genome of the trichomonas organism, they found additional genes contributing to the hydrogenosome that they had not seen when they actually dissected it uh, biochemically and looked for those enzymes because that's what Dr. Miklos Mueller in Dudu's lab uh, spent his, most of his career doing is looking at the enzymes associated with the production of molecular hydrogen. So here we have, uh, and that might contribute to the odor as well because it mobilizes all of those um, dead cell products. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some uh, squalene and uh, lots of other uh, 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 breakdown products of fatty acids that contribute to this as well because, remember, it's an obligate anaerobic organism living in a microaerophilic environment. So you've got yeah. a lot of byproducts produced that are volatile uh, organics as well. Yeah, it's actually the, so the amines are going to be more released from your bacterial vaginosis, oh, okay. vaginitis, than oh, your okay. trick, your trick. Oh, okay. um, and then the pH, you're going to have a higher pH oh. with the BV, a lower pH with the trichomoniasis infection. Is that a, a treatment for people who are resistant to antibiotics? Say that again? So, say for instance, you treat your patient for the, uh, the vaginitis that she exhibits, okay. and it doesn't go away. Um, and you give more and more antibiotic, and it still doesn't go away, and you know that it's being caused by that, changing the pH of the vagina with uh, vinegar douches is one approach that, at least that's an old world approach. I don't know if that's still in vogue or not, um, but yeah, just to say it, yeah, at least. Yeah, there's a lot of concerns, right, because part of what protects us is a, is a flow of secretions in yeah, one but, direction, yeah, and there's but, sort of a concern, you know, here you have someone with a problem, and now you're forcing <laughs> something upstream, and so we... we, uh -huh. we <laughs> Right. Often don't recommend right. douching in all honesty, right. Um, right. though. Okay. So yeah, that would that wouldn't necessarily be one of the top things we. Okay, fine. I mean, uh, that's a good clarification. So they found a very high correlation between this Mycoplasma gerardi and trichomoniasis, higher than uh, any of the other vaginal conditions. Right. right? Uh, the the relative risk was twenty. It compared with, uh, I think, three for yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another condition, which is eluding me here. So, so a lot of this is metadata. Is that correct? Sorry. Uh, they didn't collect it, they, but they correlated it. Well, yeah, once they have the um, presence of the mycoplasma in the person, they can then say, how does it correlate with a specific condition? Right. So it, it's, it's most highly correlated with trichomoniasis, um, 20, but and then with um, bacterial vaginosis, it was 2.5, right, mm. so it's much lower. And then they diagnose these by either AMP cells or Nugents, as you've just heard, and there was very low uh, correlation with, with, with positive diagnoses by those two methods. So basically, right. it's very strong with, with trichomonas. Um, now, half of the, uh, they say here, half up to half of the infections with trick are undiagnosed or asymptomatic. Absolutely. Um, Especially in men. 49 of 51 women who carried mycoplasma also carry trichomonas. So there's a strong correlation with the, of the two of them together. However, 22 women with no diagnosis who were positive for the mycoplasma were also positive for trichomonas, but three... Uh, were negative. So there are some women that have the mycoplasma without trichomonas, so there's, they don't need each other, absolutely. Right. right. So this is where it gets difficult because 
you know, it, it, if it were obligate, if they were an obligate symbiosis, right? They absolutely need each other. They would be together all of the course, time, but they're not. Course. No. So they may be helping, right? And whether they do or not is something that it remains may be to be figured out. In the sense, that, but um, they, yeah. they don't absolutely need each other, right? But in the other cases, it's fairly clear cut. Yeah, they're both there. Yeah, that's right. So they I also wonder, do. They also do some. Uh, fluorescent in C2 hybridization and show yeah, that yeah. maybe uh, Daniel can clarify. They say the bacterium is prominent in polymicrobial biofilms, sometimes associated with clue cells, which are characteristic of vaginal uh, bacterial vaginosis. Hmm. Do you know yes. what a clue cell is? Yes. They're actually uh, <laughs> sort of a, sort of a have, large... I have yes, no yes, yes, <laughs> that's, that's good. <laughs> no, they're actually... Um, they're, I believe, actually an epithelial cell. But what they are is it's a large, flat cell yeah. um, with a nucleus. And you see the bacteria speckled on top of it. And again, when you're doing your wet mount, um, okay. you can see this even with the wet mount. You don't need to grab stain. And you see the cell with all the speckled, almost like grapes on top of it. All the, Interesting. Yeah. So, so they're on top. They haven't yet been included into the cytoplasm through endocytosis. True, true. All right. They're extracellular. And okay. And I'm sure there's a great Google clue cell image, but yeah. Right. Maybe we can use that in our title somewhere. <laughs> we could. <laughs> so trichomonas needs to eat cells in order to live. It, it actually ingests cells. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a cell eater. So it ingests not just the epithelium, but it must ingest all these other microbial contaminants in the vaginal tract as well. Oh, do they? Do we know this? So, well, we, from its genome, I think we do know this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because once they did ingest these things and released all these compounds inside of them, some of the genes from bacterial species have escaped and been included into the, uh, the genome of the organism itself. So that's how it acquires a lot of these lateral do transfers. Do you think it eats so to the mycoplasma too, Dixon? Well, th this raises a whole bunch of interesting questions that have yet to be answered. But Are there mycoplasma genes in trichomonas? Well, I believe that they indicated, well, they said bacterial. So if yeah. mycoplasma is bacteria, yeah. it didn't say exactly what. <clears throat> my, my other readings took me off in a direction of trying to transfect... Uh, hydrogenosome genes into E. coli to get it to produce molecular hydrogen, but that hasn't, uh, I haven't seen the results of that. Dixon, this, this mycoplasma had been discovered previously and um, suggested to be an obligate symbiont of trichomonas, but they, they show not. here that it's not yeah. because eight women have it yeah. without um, trichomonas, so it's not an obligate symbiont. Right. But they do mention that. Um, they together that and you you mentioned this before, Daniel. They upregulate the pro-inflammatory response more than mm -hmm. each one by itself. So, um, what the real question here is? We have this association, right? What do you do next? Well, <laughs> take it, Daniel. <laughs> I mean, is this an IL seventeen driven system? By the way, am I? I don't know. Off base in that sense. I, I've heard recently that the uh, the inflammatome. Uh, is dependent upon uh, IL-17 and other related ILs. So I'll, I'll we had answer. it on a TWIV uh, recently, didn't we? Yeah. Well, the TH-17 regulatory T cells yeah, yeah, produce yeah. IL-17, Dixon, and they're really important for inflammation, in, in inflammation right? right? So I don't. Right. Is there some evidence that it's playing a role? I don't no. know. That's another question that needs to be answered, though, isn't it? Yeah, so I'll answer both those. You know, what? Why do we care? Which is, which <laughs> right. you know, is often what the clinician comes back to the scientist with. That's well, great, but why do we both care? Of those people. Yes, so you're talking yes. to yourself right now. I know it's, it's <laughs> disturbing at times. But no, so the so the so it's a TLR two agonist. Now, what is TLR two? Why why do we think? What is that? And. Um, it's an LPS sensor, so something that might be on the surface of gram negatives. For those people that yeah. Didn't really actually know what that was. That's right. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, or LPS. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, something on the surface of gram negative um, bacteria, ah, okay. so to, to okay. move us over it's to a sensor the other. molecule for bacterial invasion. But interesting enough, it also, um, TLR2 also senses trypanosomes. Really? Schistosomi, Mansoni, really? yeah. So, there, so it, it senses a lot. So it's a pretty broad, it's one of the huh. nine. Um, toll-like receptors. Oh. Um, maybe there's 10, who knows. But um, So it's a broad um, sensor of inflammation that's firing things up. But, but why do we care? And it may be oh. that, as, as we mentioned before, there's a concern with drug resistance in trichomoniasis. Of course, of course. And it's, it's probably about either side of 5% now. 
um, which really? is a which is a concern. So we use these large doses up front to try to treat it. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we have to get the CDC involved. So it would be nice to say, well, okay, you treated with your tenetazole and it failed, um, and now we confirm that there's an issue here. Can you go ahead and target mycoplasm? Now, mycoplasm doesn't have a cell right. wall, so you're going to use right. certain antimicrobials like doxycycline. They'll go after ribosomes sure, or something. Sure. Um, just like the things they're sequencing. So it, it may potentially have a, um, a purpose in the clinic of knowing something. Are these foams or creams or suppositories that you're talking about now? So the, the pills that we use um, are pills. They're just you oh, take okay. two grams and, and you're done with it. But um, sometimes we'll use a clindamycin gel in okay. certain okay. circumstances. Good. So um, just to clarify that. For bacterial vaginosis. Right, not for for this. It's going to be it's right. going to be a pill. You right. take a pill, and right, you're right, going right, to right. unless you're Irish, you can't drink. <laughs> the the genome of this mycoplasma encodes proteins that are known to be toll-like receptor two ligands in other species. So the implication is that they could be causing inflammation, but, but we don't know because we don't even know if the proteins are made. But okay. that's something that could be studied. Yeah. Why did you bring up TH17 in, in IL-17? Well, because we had mentioned it in an earlier TWIV episode as being important for the inflammation response to certain viral infections, and I just wondered yeah. whether or not it was also present here. Yeah, well, they certainly have a role in inflammation caused by viruses, but whether they do here, who knows, right? Okay. Well, the real question here is this association uh, meaningful in any way. Right. Right, and... Sure. So what do you do? Do you do another study where... Can't do that study. <laughs> what study? Well, I mean, you'd say, well, I, I'll I treat this or yet. that, but I won't treat them both and see what happens. That's that's you no, got to treat I, them both when you see them. I think. Well, but I think we have we have a growing population of people with drug resistant um, okay. trichomoniasis, okay. and I, and I think you know okay. things like doxycycline are not very toxic drugs, and so it wouldn't no, be unreasonable right. to say, listen, you ten people, we're going to give you doxycycline, you ten people, you we're going to follow and, and see if it resolves on its own, you know, and then even crossovers if you need. So it's it wouldn't be a hard... Um, Sell for the IRB? Yeah, no, I wouldn't think so. So you would set up a study where you... And that's really Look the way to and that's really the way to do it. I mean, you hate you'd hate to have people leave the show and be like, "Oh, I'm going to just start throwing doxycycline at people." You, uh, <clears throat> you know, you really want to create knowledge that then you can give to lots of people. So right. So it's a good starting point, and it's a good point for discussion. But it didn't resolve anything yet. No. But that's often what good research does. It just starts something. You know, right? it's it's not all black and white out there, folks. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> part two. of the new twip, the new twip, the new twip. That's right. So I brought Starts a, I a brought case. a case. I brought a case. We have and, a case. Uh, we have a person actually. This is actually a <laughs> real case. It's very detailed. Uh, I don't know if all my cases will be this detailed, but this is very detailed. So we'll start off strong, and then we'll just um, <laughs> fade away. We'll just fade away. It'll just get worse and worse. <laughs> we could post um, the details on the show notes too. How are we going to do that, Dixon? I have no idea. Uh, I don't know how to do that, Vincent. I know. Okay. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know it's if it's a wee thing. I'm going to have to listen, Dixon. <laughs> yeah, people people can listen and take notes, and since it's recorded, they can listen again. And yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so what I'm going to do? Let me go ahead, and uh, you know, we like this in clinical medicine because once you have a person in mind, maybe it yeah. focuses. It makes you listen a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, or not. So this is a real case, and I was on the ID consult service at a hospital in Queens during January of 2013. And we were asked to see a 29-year-old woman who was a resident of Queens, and she'd been admitted to the OBGYN, the Obstetrics Gynecology Service, with, um, we have suprapubic tenderness, so that's pain in the very lower abdomen just above the, the pubis bone. Um, She's having left flank pain. This is a real case. So you're going to get the real details. Um, chills and fever for about a day. Uh, this young woman uh, reported no increase in urinary frequency, no blood in the urine. Uh, she tells us that she's married. She's been sexually active um, just with her husband using condoms for contraception. Um, she recurred, reported that the current pain felt like the same pain she experienced when she delivered her children. Uh, she had a headache with some mild neck pain. No diarrhea, no constipation, no nausea, no vomiting, no trouble breathing, no chest pain. And um, on the initial history, there was no travel in the last three years. So we pause, wow. so we pause for a second wow, with all that shall, in mind. We shall. Yeah. So the physicians all gather around and mumble, 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 mumble. 
and they come back and say, oh, "Tell us more, tell us more." I- exactly, and that's um, <laughs> you know they say they say the history is the most important and the least reliable bit of information, um, but then again, key is actually getting the history, the history that you need. So so we go into a little more depth with her. Um, as far as past medical history, she has a history of migraines. She had a prior ovarian cyst, um, prior issue with kidney stones. Um, she reports a prior uterine infection um, that she was seen in an outpatient clinic. They gave her some antibiotics. She doesn't know what. It got all better. <laughs> okay. That, that's <laughs> often what we get. pain went away. <laughs> um, she had her tonsils out in childhood. She says she's not allergic to any medicines. Um, her father also had um, kidney stones, and when we take our family history, as far as medication, she'll occasionally take Imitrex for her migraines. Social history, um, she is a homemaker. She lives at home, takes care of the kids. Um, she lives with her husband and the children. She's never been a smoker. As we say, no toxic habits, no report okay. of drug use or things like that. Good. But now we take a more detailed, what I call travel geographical history. Uh-huh. I would sort of go back to, well, where were you born? Tell us the whole geography. <laughs> and maybe that will be important or not. She was born in Bangladesh. She moved to the U.S. in 2008. Uh-huh. And she had been back to visit just a little over three years ago. So that, have you been anywhere in three years? years? Right. <laughs> she had, actually. Um, and you can ask me more questions about that. <laughs> um, and, I, you know, and we asked, do you have any pets in the home? Uh, maybe you'll want to know about pets and animal exposures while in Bangladesh, but we can get there. We go through the whole review of systems where anything else going on, and basically we've captured that in the, in the history of the present illness. She's 101.6 when we see her. Blood pressure is 95 over 60. Heart rate is a little elevated at 118. Um, she's breathing comfortably in the high teens. Um, 100% is her oxygen saturation on room air, which is checked. On exam, what do we find on exam? The only thing actually exciting that we find, if it's even exciting, her mouth's a little dry, um, her lungs are clear, and her heart's going a little bit rapid. Her belly is soft, it's benign. Physicians gather again. So, Dixon, (laughs) are these all going to be parasitic infections? We don't know, do we? I don't know. I thought that was we the point, right? We can't know the answer until we get the result. No, this is TWIP, Dixon. It's it's TWIP. Is. What we're trying to do in in this these clinical presentations is to convince the listener that parasitic diseases in people are not necessarily diagnosable by the symptoms and by all the answers to these questions. Okay. There are lessons to be learned at every level. <laughs> Daniel, are these going to be all parasite infections? So no, no. Actually, the the so w- what I was given is they will either be a parasitic infection or a lookalike parasitic a infection. Mimetic. Mimetic. Par- okay, but, that's fine. Par- but, 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 to, but, that's but fine. for but for starters, just for everyone, this is a parasitic okay. infection. Keep this one simple. Okay. And to you're start going with. to you're not going to give us lab tests, are you? No, actually, I will give you no, I will give you very no, basic no. lab tests. And no. what I will say is the you're the white the white count was not elevated. CBC, here we go. So the complete blood count, the hematocrit, mm-hmm. so the level of the red cells, yeah. um, the hemoglobin, those are normal. The platelet level is a little low, 163. Her chemistries, kidney function, sugar level, sodium, potassium, all look just fine. Um, her urine analysis, again, mm. um, looks fine. Um, we did some liver tests. Uh-huh. We made sure she wasn't pregnant. Right. They're all normal. <laughs> She's not pregnant. Right. Um, the urine, actually, I'm going to give you 48 hours later. It's not growing anything. It's nothing in the urine. Excellent. But she's got belly pain. So somebody scans her belly. Okay. It's a very low belly pain, right? So she, she says, says it's super, very low. She super says super pubic. Super pubic. Okay. What kind of pain is it? Um, it's apparently as severe as oh, birth. when she had I her children. That. Is it a focal <laughs> pain or a generalized pain? It's focal. Focal. She likes to point to it She's, with her. You could draw a little magic marker circle around and say it's there. She could put a few fingers and it's right it's here. Focal. It's, it's really is a continuous and it's pain. it's not a, an appendicitis type of pain. Yeah, no, it's fairly continuous. Okay. Yep. So, but then... Uh, we get the cat scan. They do a cat scan. We get scan. the cat scan. Remember, this is a real case, so we're getting we're here getting you. the, the you. real case, you not the, data not, not the textbook. She hasn't read the textbook. She doesn't <laughs> know what to do. And so, the cat scan, and this is actually what prompted them to call us, because this is what confused the, the primary team, mm-hmm. is there is a mass in the liver 
that is 8 by 4 centimeters, wow. by 5 centimeters, wow. by 5.2 centimeters. Wow. Hmm. Inner liver, though, that's pretty high. It's inner, it's inner liver. This is higher it's than where liver. the pain is. Yes. That's a confusing. Yep. And I actually even have pictures for you guys. I don't know if that's something that you'll want to put on the... So th- could that cause suprapubic pain? So I don't think so. Okay. Not referred pain. And, referred I, and, pain I think, yeah. and I think that's important in the case is that... Um, I would agree. Trying to, trying to put your symptoms together. Yep. Um, Any other lab tests? It's not tuberculosis. Other lab tests? It's not tuberculosis, right? Well, that's a good. That's a good. <laughs> so Vince is starting I'm, to I'm diagnose. Nice. Or he's starting nice. to throw out real things. You have to be nice, but yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I won't. So I won't tell you yes or no because you might throw out the right. So, but you, but we can. You can start asking me more so questions. I'm going to ask you a question of what other tests would you think of running at this point to rule in the possibility of identifying that object? So they they've already started the routine first world testing on this first world. and and this is actually important because it's maybe going to tell us a little bit i mean could it be a back. hepatoma for instance um because you know we're asking a lot of questions the first question you guys asked which is great is, is this pain but in this the super pubic area is... even related All right can you describe um, the, the the picture for the listeners so yeah i'll describe it so it's Would you please? it looks like a simple um cyst it does not look as though there's any loculations any divisions in here it looks like one continuous um it looks less dense than the tissue around it. Is, is less that correct? And it, is, it is less dense okay. than the surrounding so tissue. So if it were a hepatoma, it would be more dense, yes? So they actually, and the radiologists, read it as less likely being a carcinoma. So they're not thinking this right. is a cancer. And we're on TWIP, so we're also not thinking this is a cancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's, you know, come on, let's not be that easy. <laughs> now, now, one of the other, I'll throw in this next, because this is going to be, you know, we had a fever, we had a sick woman in the in hospital, hospital, right? right, right. And, and we're also asking the question is that related to this too or is this just she happened to come to medical right. attention for some other reason right. and now we've got this to handle this and is so an incidental finding to her real problem and perhaps. and I'm, and so they do go ahead and they do a um they do a respiratory viral panel where they do a pcr okay, okay. Um, which comes back positive for influenza b so they just mm-hmm. follow her the fever resolves she doesn't get any more antibiotics they stop the antibiotics they had started she feels she feels all better, but she has this as an thing. No she more, was now no as more as pain. No, the pain it's gone. Pain gets so, better. Uh, but I have some other questions about the lab test, though. There were other lab tests that you might have thought of running. So there, so there were some other lab tests. Do you, do you want any more history? <laughs> I want to ask you if the pain was just a <laughs> yeah, recent what about uh, pain, or is it long true time? the pain the pain was recent? It came on with the with the fever, no, with the pain. feeling poorly, and when she felt better, the pain went away. So it was actually just, we'll say, fortuitous or not. It was incidental. We're thinking at this yeah, point. It's incidental. What about the rest of her family? The um, rest of the family um, is, is fine. No upper respiratory infections, no unexplained pain. No. No. And they didn't go back or did go back to Bangladesh with her? So she did, she did go back with family when she went back to Bangladesh. Right, because that's usually the case. Yeah. And where in Bangladesh? Um, it's a rural area, mm. and she was there, and she helped her dad a little bit with what he does for his occupation. Right. And Vincent, you have to ask that question then. <clears throat> what question? What does her father do? What does her father do? <laughs> he um, he raises sheep yeah. and goats. I know what it is. Thank you. Don't even say yeah, it. I don't even say think it. it. I know what it is. Don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about it on Twip. Well, of course we did. But no, this is not a foreign no, it's fine. discussion. But it's it's an introduction to the way we want to run this it's every cool. time. And yes, he also uses dogs oh to boy. help control the animals. That's enough. And you, she was there for about three months helping. This. You've probably said too much. Already. No, no, maybe <laughs> not, maybe not because so you're you're thinking of something you want to order. Do you want to order a test? Do you want to? What do you want to do? Oh, we could order a lot of tests. And and I always I always say that's the that was the one thing they when I trained at Bellevue they always told us it's easy to know the right answer right yeah but what's really hard to know is what do you do next exactly. so now you think you know what to do <laughs> that's true, you think, that's so true. <laughs> you can order a bu- so what do you what do you do so, so what if i ordered that test and that test came back positive for what i thought this was then what do you do that's that's another question so i will i will tell you they order an igg eliza right for the specific thing that is associated with sheep in bangladesh and exactly. it comes back negative oh uh. Bummer. So that's important. Too. Really? Comes back negative. Ah, so Vincent now is scratching his eyebrow. <laughs> Am I going to throw out what I think it is? I believe you are going to throw that one away. Well, I believe you are. Should we do a biopsy of this mass? Oh, that's dangerous. 
That is dangerous. I would do other tests first. I mean, as a parasitic disease person, yeah. I would certainly want to see a blood smear. Okay, so they so we do a blood smear. It's That's a CBC, but you should also look yeah. at parasites at this yeah. point because Bangladesh has lots of malaria. So the blood smear is negative. Negative. What about a stool exam? So a stool exam is done. How many? Three of them, and they Good. do them. It's actually done well. A gastroenterologist, an ID Terrific. doc's involved. Terrific. It's all negative. All negative. Yeah. And what about scoping her? So because she sees a gastroenterologist, of course they scope her <laughs> up, up and below. <laughs> yeah. You know? And what do they and, see and below? They, yeah, they don't see anything they that see really not. sheds sheds light on this. They see nothing. So now you have a what we would call a fascinoma. Okay. Uh, that's that's the term we used around here. What does that mean? You know, instead of knowing what the oma is, it's a uh, fascinating it's undefinable oma? so far. So it's they call a, it a fascinoma. It's incidental. So oma. we don't know what it is, <laughs> and we're certainly not going to say it on the air because we want our listeners to try to guess along yep. with us. So, so there are there other tests that you can think of running that we haven't thought of already that would rule this object into your picture. That's the question, isn't it? So, so, what do you want people to respond with? No, no, us. We can do this here first, and if 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 we oh, get test. it right, then you can edit it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to give it away. Well, you're the diagnostician. What else? Well, would you do? I was a laboratory diagnostician. So, so what sort of so, laboratory? So we did uh, we did uh, blood smears, nothing. We did stool exams, nothing. Did do we do urine yet? We did urine, nothing. Nothing. So, no overt production of a stage that we might recognize that would rule this object into our picture. So far. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? And, of course, the assumption is that this is some kind of an infection. Mm -hmm. But that may not be true. Well, we know this. Well, we've, we've, already, we've already made it easy on the listeners <laughs> and said this will be a parasite. Okay, it's, okay, it's a parasite. It's, it's a, it, by the way, what is the size of that cyst again? It is uh, five mm -hmm. centimeters by five centimeters, and it's eight hollow. by it eight hollow. centimeters. It is a fluid-filled cyst, and it, it was negative cyst. for the particular parasite that Doctor Racaniello had in mind. Well, the, he said there was. I said I that the. the blood, I basically said that the that we did parasitology IgG elizas, and they were all negative. But that doesn't mean that this is not that organism. True. True, that is true. There's the possibility that the sensitivity of the assay is not very good, and Correct, so it still could be. Or, exactly. Or it was run incompetently, or it's yes. another related parasite which doesn't cross-react with this one. True, true. And in and sort of as a final little bit of information, right. she's followed until yes. May. They repeat an MRI, and it is unchanged. That's a relief, because that rules out carcinomas probably. Mm -hmm. That's good. She's probably relieved to hear that, but still she's upset over the fact that she's carrying something other than herself in her yes, liver. Yes, she's got some large some cyst. And it, the cyst's shape has not changed either? No, it's unchanged. It hasn't reoriented itself or there aren't other little channels leading off in other directions? No, no, that's good, good questions. <laughs> because, because in that area of the world, there are lots of organisms that we don't talk about much, that they talk about a lot, yes. which could be involved in this particular uh, mm -hmm. So she's no fever, no change, and so. Fascinating. And no diagnostic stage. Right. So you're stuck. With so we're stuck, and I guess the reader the reader will get to think about this, and the important sure. thing is going to be, what do you do? Well, I think... Because we're going to get a diagnosis. We've got but, a yield to we've got a, uh, we've got a here. Okay. Which is what? Is to biopsy it. So you said this was a solid cyst, not, not a liquid. So it's, well, it's it is fluid filled. It is fluid filled. So that you can you can offer that as a... So your, your idea is you're going to take a... You know, you call interventional radiologist and okay. say stick a needle in and tell me what that is. The 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 uh, danger, the biggest danger of this, if you biopsy the liver, for instance, and the patient breathes at the same time and you're not in the cyst at that moment, you could cause that patient to bleed out. Okay, which is not not a huge risk in all honesty. She has low platelets. Yeah, we, well, she did, but that was when she was like acutely ill with pneumonia or oh, with okay. with influenza. Oh, okay, that might have been dietary. But, but now she's now she's fine. Now she has okay. normal liver function. Okay. It's so all. the consequences <clears throat> of biopsying a fluid-filled cyst that turns out to be related to the organism that Dr. Racaniello alluded to, but didn't describe per se, is that if you rupture that cyst, 
you, it can, in quotes, metastasize to other parts of the body, and the patient can really be in big trouble in a hurry. Or they could die of anaphylactic shock. Or they could, well, on the right. pulling back on the syringe the whole time, but nonetheless, this yep. is true. This is true. So that that's a dangerous procedure no matter what. And since the life of the patient isn't at stake right now because she feels fine, Right. Well, we're we're stuck with doing. Um, yeah, and we'll discuss that next time. Can well, you take someone like this and just say, "Don't worry about it. We'll I do an MRI." Another, okay. I have another visualization approach first. Yes. Not an MRI. What about a CAT scan? What about something more fine in terms of resolving structures? Yeah. So the the CT actually, where these were the two images that I showed you guys. I don't know if these will end up something we want to put up, but the CT and the MRI. All right. There are unrevealing difference. And some some people like ultrasounds but in the first world it's actually often mm -hmm. ct and mri that mm -hmm. we're that we're using because i know that there are some uh finely resolving ultrasound techniques that are now employed to get down into the almost the cellular level at this point yeah i would say experts in the field and there was a paper that came out about a year or two ago really pushing the idea of ultrasound as um as an approach that helps with this diagnosis. Okay, fine. And there are but it's still not going to confirm it. Ultimately, we're going to need some sort sure. of way to know for certain what this person has. So you say fluid-filled cyst. Are there things floating in that cyst, or is that just clear fluid? Not that we can see from an imaging So it doesn't approach. show up as any different. That's, that's, that's also very important to know. Mm -hmm. And it's fairly large. I mean, that's a pretty large cyst for yes. most things. So, for instance, the things that it's not. Okay. This is good. Let's say what it's not first, okay? And then leave the audience it's not, with that. It's not a tumor, right? It's not a tumor. It's not at least hydatid disease as diagnosed by immunological tests. It's not a hemangioma. It's not a, we didn't say that. But we know the it's a parasite, the only, the only, so it's not a hemangioma yeah. because it's not, <laughs> it's that's not an infection. <laughs> yeah, he said yes. it was a parasite, but it could be a hemangioma, right? There could mm. be a hemangioma and a parasite, right? They could be somehow involved. But it is a, there's a parasite somehow involved we know in the is, picture. Is, and so entamoeba histolytica that goes extra-intestinally often goes to the liver, mm -hmm. and it develops into a large cyst. And the cyst is really not a cyst, it's an abscess. Yeah. So an abscess is a... Uh, is a uh, sort of a pasty-filled remnant of liver tissue that the parasite has killed by secreting exoenzymes on mm -hmm. its way to ingesting living cells. That's the origin of that. So if you yep. were to puncture it with a needle and try to draw the fluid back, there is no fluid. They call it anchovy paste. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as a result, it's not that either because that's a much more dense presentation okay. on ultrasound or on but it's nice you're giving a nice differential so you mentioned um, yeah, yeah. We, we we pushed cancer very low right. we mesh sure. mentioned entamoeba occasionally we would invite in a radiologist to actually explain that to the students uh, because they got it they got the, the the view of that from the person who made that uh, radiogram mm -hmm. so what about using and you, uh, and said, you, you ruled out amoebic abscesses yeah because it's not an <coughs> abscess it's a cyst it's a yeah. fluid full cyst so fluid full cysts differ greatly from the abscesses, okay? So what about using something like technetium to get a further resolution of the, of the uh, So that was, that was not done, but I will, I'm sort of making a list here. So you, meant, you mentioned entamoeba cysts, which are pushing down low. Yeah. You mentioned echinococcus, which you said we have a negative serology. Right. That's, right. I think, what you guys were asking. Right. Um, you, you seem to be alluding to a fasciola hepatica with the, are we seeing progression? But then you seem to, there was to some be of that dropping that implied low. in my questioning because in that area of the world, it's not fasciola, it's fasciolopsis busci. And there are other related liver seeking parasites in hmm. that uh, large family of flukes. Mm -hmm. And but they don't look like that. Usually they make tunnels and they usually, they are feeding on epithelium that they're growing by secreting high, uh, high levels of, of proline, believe it or not, <laughs> I know this sounds weird, but, but fasciola will sit above the lesion that it's made by eating the liver tissue away, and it secretes huge amounts of proline, which apparently stimulates the production of lots of epithelial cells. And then it goes down the tube and mows the lawn, so to speak, and eats those epithelial <laughs> cells, crawls back up again and starts secreting more proline to make more epithelium so that it can still feed. And you can actually see those channels on ultrasound or on a CT. They're quite easy mm -hmm. to, to distinguish from what I'm looking at here. So I don't think it's one of those either. Okay. But paragonimus... 
which is a another parasite in the area getting into us through the ingestion of uh, raw crustaceans of various sorts, freshwater crustaceans in this case, mm-hmm. um, has the possibility of presenting like this, but you would see the organisms inside. They're huge. Mm-hmm. They're actually very large. So they would reflect some of the densities that you would expect them to have. That's, that's my yeah. opinion. I mean, No, and we actually have a paragonimus um, that's indigenous to the U.S. And there's we do. some we cases, do. We do. so maybe I can even present one of those. We, I, would, I would love you to. So Western Monty... So this may not be that. This may not... <laughs> that probably isn't that. <laughs> so those are my initial thoughts. What about a hydatid cyst? Well, that's the kind of coccus. The kind of coccus. You see yeah, but there are out. tons of other tapeworms out there that are, that are ill-defined like... Uh, Monesia, for instance, mm. and um, Maniliformis, and I'm going to give you some other names. Um, they can uh, form liver. Well, cysts. they form these weird cysts, Conurus-like cysts. Uh, okay. cysts, and uh, they're, they're weird organisms. You encounter the egg, and you get the cyst just like you do with Hydatid, but they, they, they present differently. <coughs> they could be one of those. Mm-hmm. Well, our listeners are not going to be able to get this because... Um, I don't know what we, it is. We can't do it. and um, So well. our, our last one will be, it could be some sort of weird esoteric thing that no one's ever heard of, but yeah. it's not No, no, it's not that. It's not that. We're diffusing that bomb <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> before we get to the real answer. Because are we missing... A, here's the hint to leave with the listeners, because I won't ask any more questions after this. Do we need to do more tests to rule this in? No, I, and actually at this point, we felt confident enough in the diagnosis that we started treatment and proceeded with a diagnostic approach and a therapeutic approach at the same time. So, so, so that's what we'll present next time is, is what were we thinking, what were concerns, how did we approach it with well, those concerns exciting. in mind, and then... So we want listeners to send in what they think is going on. Exactly. Why, right? right? You bet. To twip at twiv.tv, right? That's right. All right, and we'll, we'll read some of those next time. We well, certainly will. And we may even come up with a prize <coughs> for the winner. Well, I, I think some kind of swag, twip swag would be great. Right? Twip, we have yeah. to develop a twip swag bag. <laughs> yeah. That's even self-promotional. So uh, they can, it uh, wouldn't yeah, be a right. bag of <laughs> twip. Right. It would be a cyst of twip, don't you think? <laughs> a twip cyst. <laughs> okay. You want to read a few emails? Well, would you please? All right. The first one is from Jess. I recently saw an article... Uh, and she links to it. Thought it might be worth a discussion on TWIP. It's about the possibility of bed bugs being a vector for T. cruzi. I would love to hear your opinion on what implications these results could have on transmission of Chagas. So this is a uh, thank you for TWIP, TWIV, and TWIM, and all the hours you put educating the public. Jess is a chemist. We have a chemist listening. So this is an, adjur- an article. Did you see this article? I didn't. And we've actually In talked the, about that. Uh, ASTMH. Yeah. What is, I, that? what is AST? It's the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, of which both uh, Dr. Griffin and myself so are members. What they do in this is that they, in the lab, show yes. that um, you can get transmission of T. cruzi between hosts and bed bugs. That's right. So, so m- here's bed bugs that fed on it, experimentally infected mice acquired the parasite and they could transmit it. So what's the implication? Well, and they can transmit it. That's the that's the point that I'm going to raise here. Listen, the point. a majority of previously uninfected mice became infected after a period of cohabitation with exposed bed bugs. Because they may have eaten them. <laughs> T. cruzi was also transmitted to mice after the feces of bed bugs were applied directly to broken host skin. Correct. You but might have eaten the bed bugs. Here's the deal. <laughs> uh, let's let's try and if I can answer this simply. All right, and then there's a more complicated answer as well. It took um, Baruch Blumberg 30-some-odd years of hard studies to prove in West Africa, unfortunately, mm-hmm. because this is not a West African disease. This is a South American disease, that bed bugs do not transmit anything that he could think of that would resemble an infectious agent from one person to another. Mm-hmm. Right? No viruses, no bacteria, no protozoans, and certainly no helminths. So let's... Now go to South America and look at the transmission cycle, and it's a large bug. It's a very large bug very that duvid. induces itching at the site of the bite. Right. And at the same time that it feeds, it defecates. It does both at the same time. To make room for the new blood meal, it gets rid of the old digested blood meal, which contains the infectious trypomasticots. And you rub it into the wound as it itches, and that's how you get infected. Okay, so bed bugs, on the other hand, I didn't mean to shout. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you, said, you, you did. Bed bugs, on the you other did. hand, <laughs> do not do those things to a human host. They do not defecate on the spot when they suck your blood because they're usually empty. So they fill up on your blood and run away. And they run very fast, by the way. <laughs> so there is no they do someone actually brought me a, a jar of them once and I was amazed at how fast they actually are mm -hmm. they're not slow little bugs but they are related to the reduvid bugs because they're hemipterans as well so they have biting mouth parts just like the the uh, reduvid bugs but they do not have the uh, habit of defecating on the spot nor do they induce as an intense itching sensation at the site of the bite during the act of biting which is an mm -hmm. essential ingredient in the transmission cycle for T. cruzi. So uh, I, I read a critique of the uh, work by another parasitologist that offered up the same response. This, this work? Yes. So, but what if so mice it's unlikely, get... It's it, unlikely. It's probably mice ate the bed bugs. Mice what if that. mice in the wild get infected? Can they transmit it to people? Mice? Now, what do reduvid... How do they reduvid acquire bugs, the um Reduvid bugs parasite. infect almost all the mammals of South America. So that's... Sure. Where, so when when a reduvid infects a person, yes, where what's the source of? Um, it could be an animal. Parasite. It could be a. It could be a dog. It could be a sloth. It could be a jaguar. It could, could be, be a be mouse. A, could be a mouse, but All right. you know, it's not likely. I mean, it doesn't have to be. It could be another person. They could even acquire it from another infected person. But but their their feeding behaviors are different and their defecation right. so behaviors you don't think that bed bugs are going to be significant transmission vectors no but the question was raised <coughs> on purpose because we have about 300,000 people in this country immigrated from uh, endemic regions of south america with a t cruzi infection latent in infection we don't know who they are because they don't know who yeah. they are so uh, and we have a lot of we have an epidemic of bed bugs. Yes, correct. And that's why the worry <laughs> was that maybe these people would serve as uh, sources of infection for other people. But uh, it's unlikely. It's the chances are that it's unlikely. Not based on the. Do you think a mouse could eat a bed bug? Uh, easily, cats, if they dogs. Move, if they move quickly, how no, could wait, they? No wait, there is. <laughs> hang on, there is there is indigenous T. cruzi infection in the United States. Yeah, it's transmitted from dog to dog by reduvid bugs. Mm -hmm. And the way it happens is that the reduvid bugs are eaten by the dogs as they're being fed on. And the, the trypanosomes are actually released inside the oral cavity and they infect through the mucous membranes. So those infections do occur, but people are not in the habit of uh, <laughs> grabbing a reduvid bug at random <laughs> and, and chewing it and eating it. But I think the mice in a cage filled with bed bugs would find those as a food source says that wild bed bugs in Argentina have been found to harbor T. cruzi. That's, I believe that's a, uh, I wouldn't say a red herring, but I don't think it plays any role yeah. at all in the epidemiology of uh, T. cruzi. But it is interesting. Likely, more likely to get it from a transfusion than you are from a bed bug. Hopefully we're going to prevent that. But no, it is interesting. What you bring up is Chagas disease is now something that we're seeing um, on a more regular basis here in the U.S. That's right, because because so many people have come. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So you do have to think about it. And it's not easy to treat. No. And in the, fact, the New York Times Magazine section three weeks ago had a case, just like we presented now, of a dermal lesion, which turned out to be leishmaniasis. Mm. So we have indigenous uh, leishmaniasis, autochthonous leishmaniasis in this country now, too. All right. There you go. That's Dixon's view. That was a long-winded view. Okay. I'm sorry to say. Peter writes, Dear Twip team, I remember Spargonosis from Twip number eight, Frog Legs and Parasite Tales. So I was interested to read of a case in the UK. The patient was from China, so presumably contracted the parasite there. The remains of the worm were sequenced and identified as Spirometra erinii europei. The species name Aaron C. Europei suggests that it was first identified from the European hedgehog, which seems strange for a parasite said to originate from the Far East. I would agree. <laughs> so they have uh, this uh, website, New Scientist. They have, they have pictures, uh, MRIs of the worm moving through the guy's brain. How about that? How about that? Um, hmm. Sequencing his genome, yes. Probably caught it from an uh, application of an amphibian... Poultice. A 50 year old Chinese man admitted to a UK hospital complaining of headaches, seizures, and altered sense of smell and memory flashbacks. His doctors were stumped. Tests for TB, syphilis, HIV, and Lyme were negative, and although an MRI showed an abnormal region, a biopsy found inflammation but no tumor. They biopsied his brain. 
Over the next four years, further MRIs recorded the abnormal region moving across the man's brain. Eek. Until finally his doctors decided to operate. To their immense surprise, they pulled a one centimeter long ribbon worm. I got it. Sequenced, and there you go. Yep. So I guess he lived, right? Yeah, remember Spirometra is a, um, a parasite of Felidae. Okay, cats, cat-like a- animals, and uh, that's its definitive host. But the intermediate hosts are amphibians and fish and things of that sort. So it, there could be many, many different species of Spirometra out there that haven't so he, even been discovered. So he acquired it in China most likely yeah, years most before. Likely. Hunan, if he's from Hunan, uh, 30% of the people have spargonosis, believe it or not. Kevin writes, thought you folks might like to hear about this. A nematode worm's brain has been mapped simulated in software, and put into a Lego robot, which now acts like a worm. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, yeah, um, very interested. Which worm? <laughs> this is C. elegans, of course. Ah, uh, C. elegans, of course. Has only 300 neurons, 302. Right. They've been completely mapped, and the <laughs> Open Worm Project is working to build a complete simulation of the worm in softwares. And one of the uh, founders put it into a Lego robot, basically. That's pretty funny. It is. The robot behaved in ways that are similar to observed C. elegans. S- stimulation of the nose stopped forward motion. Touching the anterior and posterior touch sensors made the robot move forward and back accordingly. Stimulating the food sensor made the robot move forward. Key point is that there's no program or learning involved to create the behaviors. There you go. Isn't that incredible? Intrinsic That's behavior. pretty cool. That is very cool. Warm bot. Andrea writes, Howdy Dixon and Vincent. I am glad for the new TWIP podcast. I'm sure you saw this story. She links to a LA Times story, uh, the headline of which is Brain Tapeworm Caused Man's Four-Year Headache. So again, more MRIs of, what is it in this case? It's a tapeworm, a four-inch long tapeworm traveled from one hemisphere of the man's brain to another. By the time doctors finally removed it, after nearly four years, the 50-year-old had suffered memory flashbacks, pain on his right side, and complex seizures. Sounds like another spirometra. Spirometra, er, same one. Erino Europea. Bingo. Maybe it's on the rise. Oh, you know what? Maybe it's the same guy. Maybe it's it's the same guy. It's the same guy. It's the same case, which we just talked about. Thank you, Andrew. When I read of it, I thought of you, too. I suffered from migraines for years, so I'm glad it wasn't a tapeworm. (laughs) Me, too. It's rainy and 50 Fahrenheit here in Seattle, just the way I love it. (laughs) I, too, am sad about the Car Talk Brothers' Tommy passing. He was such a joy. Yep, yep, yep. All right. um, Let's skip to Winks, because this will be the last one. Wink is our friend who's a physician. I love the last twip and all the rest. I had read long ago that Vivax relapse occur with a periodicity of three months. Not necessarily every three months, but multiples of three months. Is this mm. true? I have no data. <laughs> Daniel, I'm sorry, I have know? no data on that whatsoever. You know, I've, I've heard that. I don't know how true it is, actually. Um, but I think there's a period of at least three to six months, and then you could see re- relapse. And I, I'm making my list of cases I will bring up in the future. And <laughs> actually, uh, <laughs> I have a case of a gentleman who went, and, and the interesting, a lot of the prophylaxis we use for malaria right it's great for things like falciparum right but it doesn't necessarily prevent things like vivax and ovale which will go and form this dormant phase in the liver and then let's say someone's lived in an area for six months they're still getting infected with malaria they're still getting these parasites in the liver and they are at risk unless they're on what we call terminal prophylaxis of at some point having it relapse um, hopefully, you're not going to have relapse every three months and not have a clinician diagnose and treat you. Yeah. But um, I could see that happening. <laughs> Especially <clears throat> if they keep moving. Yes. So those are the hypnozoite stages, by the way, that were referred to. Yes. And um, that was the last little piece of that life cycle that was discovered um, before we understood why the relapses were occurring. The one that we don't understand is the recrudescence in Plasmodium malariae. That's the one we don't understand. And remember, uh, I believe it was one of our recent twips, we discussed the emergence due to deforestation in Malaysia of Plasmodium nolzi, which we have to add to the list now as a human malarial parasite. 
Right. It used to be in monkeys, but it's now we, all we endemic that, in people. Right? We did so that. rats are right. So now we have five of them. In Malaysia, right? It just That's correct. That is correct. And it's associated with deforestation and, and encroachment. Yes, it really is becoming the fifth human malaria. It is becoming the fifth. All right, one more. One more. Oystein writes. Oystein is from Ethiopia. No, he's from Norway, but he's currently in Ethiopia. Yes, I, I remember that. I just read an intriguing article on the parasite Cryptosporidium that concludes, quote, the observation of extracellular developmental stages in this study further supports suggestions that classification of Cryptosporidium as an obligate intracellular apicomplexin may require revision. Uh-huh. And he, atta- he sent us an article which basically says that it's open access so everyone can see it. Extracellular existation and development of cryptosporidium, tracing the fate of oocysts right. within Pseudomonas aquatic biofilm systems. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, it might be a transition epicomplexin. The story between. of... Sorry. No, no, no. no I'm just thinking out loud here. Because almost, to my knowledge, none of them have any extracellular stages except uh, cryptosporidium and cyclospora. The story of this parasite is unfolding before our eyes. Maybe you would like to revisit this parasite again on your show. Cryptosporidium sure. research is generating more interest than before because of the new evidence from the global enteric multicenter study that cryptosporidium ranks as the second most important cause of severe childhood diarrhea after rotavirus. Well, that's right. If the parasite can replicate in biofilms growing on the inside of our water pipes, that would be weird. we might have a bigger problem than we realized. That would be weird. I still follow all your Twix family shows with great pleasure and have been following you since the very beginning. Thank you again for your inspiring podcasts. He is a consultant clinical microbiologist. Okay, so this paper, hmm, let's go back and look. So these things can exist in biofilms. Hmm? I know they can survive in biofilms. I didn't realize that they were replicating throughout well, you, you, all the <coughs> stages that you would find in intracellular stages. It says here, we use confocal laser scanning microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, and flow cytometry to identify various stages present within aquatic biofilm systems. We show that cryptosporidium has the ability to form a parasitophorous vacuole independently in a host-free biofilm environment, allow- potentially allowing them to complete an extracellular life cycle. Oh. Potentially allowing them. Didn't say they did. Yeah. These observations not only highlight the risk that aquatic biofilms pose in regards to outbreaks, but further indicate that even simple biofilms are able to stimulate oocyst existation and support the extracellular multiplication and development of cryptosporidium. Interesting. I need to see the proof on that one before I'll be a believer. I'm would you afraid. like to read this paper? I would love to read that paper. Right, why don't you, I'll send it to you. Would you please? And then if you think merits a... a we will go through we it. We can go through it. We okay. will do that. Because you're the expert. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, who is that? <laughs> there, you know, she used to be here. Her name was Sylvia LeBlanc. She had actually done some. She's work a on, crypto expert. She did some work on crypto as well. Where is she now? Margaret Perkins worked with her on crypto. So we're uh, Sylvia LeBlanc now works for the Duke Foundation, Doris Duke Foundation, turning cigarette money into um, peaceful uses. <laughs> <laughs> I have to read one more because this is great. Please. You're going to love this. I'm going I'm to move this up here. <laughs> um, this is from Sharmby. Hi, my, hey, my name is Sharmby. I'm in College Park, Maryland. I started listening to TWIP in August 2014 in order. As I type, I'm on number 52. Great. It's been extremely entertaining hearing you guys talk so much mess to each other, and yet so <laughs> humble each time. Perfect. I'm not a student or working in any type of science field, but I love all science. Dr. D, I've been thinking of tall buildings to grow crops for years before I knew other people actually started it. Finding you was mind-blowing with your fancy vertical farm. If you guys read this, it will be awesome to hear my name by the time I catch up to the episode. <laughs> I can clearly see you guys have plenty of content, so I won't ask, don't stop. In episode 52, a listener tells of a great-grandparent sick with malaria in the past. That reminded me of the book As I Lay Dying, where a dying mother or grandmother rode in a wagon on a long trip. Maybe they had malaria in the book, just a random thought. Anyway, keep up the great work. Oh yeah, you don't need me to tell you, but I want 
to say forget that guy or anybody who comments on your style. Tell as many stories, related or unrelated, as you like. <laughs> Whose names are on the title? Like I said, you guys are the perfect blend of a wealth of knowledge and some comedy. Vince bashes Dixon, while Dixon is humble about it. <laughs> then Dixon is more is like more rough and gruff and more crude in a good way, while Vince tries to defend the subject at hand. Great stuff. I probably won't write again, so I'm getting it all out now. I'm a delivery driver with La Prima Catering. And I go to Walter Reed, NIH, NASA, NOAA, UMD oh, wow. very often. Wow, wow, and it's wow. so cool hearing what's going on in these places. Wow, 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 wow. I think I'm done. SB out. Wow. Wow. That's great. That's fantastic. So there was a, a book written by uh, uh, Henry James <laughs> called Daisy Miller. Yeah. And I believe it was Daisy Miller. Uh, I recently read about half of that book. Okay. And she <laughs> migrates to Italy to visit.